was the answer. Howsoever, so be it. Amen. After a little while of silence, he said he thought somebody might read a prayer. It's the custom, sir, he added apologetically. And not long after, without another word, he passed away. In the meantime, the captain, whom I had observed to be wonderfully swollen about the chest and pockets, had turned out a great many various stores the British colors, a Bible, a coil of stoutish rope, pen, ink, the log book, and pounds of tobacco. He had found a longish fir tree lying felled and trimmed in the enclosure, and with the help of Hunter, he had set it up at the corner of the log house where the trunks crossed and made an angle. Then, climbing on the roof, he had with his own hand bent and run up the colors. This seemed mightily to relieve him. He re-entered the log house and set about counting up the stores as if nothing else existed. But he had an eye on Tom's passage for all that, and as soon as all was over, came forward with another flag and reverently spread it on the body. Don't you take on, sir, he said, shaking the squire's hand. All's well with him. No fear for a hand that's been shot down in his duty to captain and owner. It mayn't be good divinity, but it's a fact. Then he pulled me aside, Dr. Livesey, he said, in how many weeks do you and Squire expect the consort? I told him it was a question not of weeks, but of months. That if we were not back by the end of August, Blanley was to send to find us, but neither sooner nor later. You can calculate for yourself, I said. Why, yes, returned the captain. Scratching his head and making a large allowance, sir, for all the gifts of Providence, I should say we were pretty close hauled. How do you mean? I asked. It's a pity, sir. We lost that second load. That's what I mean, replied the captain. As for powder and shot, we'll do. But the rations are short. Very short, so short, Dr. Livesey. That were perhaps as well without that extra mouth and he pointed to the dead body under the flag. Just then, with a roar and a whistle, a round shot passed high above the roof of the log house and plumped far beyond us in the wood. Oh ho, said the captain, blaze away. You've little enough powder already, my lads. At the second trial, the aim was better, and the ball descended inside the stockade, scattering a cloud of sand, but doing no further damage. Captain, said the squire, the house is quite invisible from the ship. It must be the flag they're aiming at. Would it not be wiser to take it in? Strike my colors, cried the captain. No, sir, not I. And as soon as he had said the words, I think we all agreed with him. For it was not only a piece of stout, seemingly good feeling. It was good policy besides, and showed our enemies that we despised their cannonade. All through the evening they kept thundering away. Ball after ball flew over or fell short or kicked up the sand in the enclosure, but they had to fire so high that the shot fell dead and buried itself in the soft sand. We had no ricochet to fear, and though one popped in through the roof of the log house and out again through the floor, we soon got used to that sort of horseplay and minded it no more than cricket. There is one good thing about all this, observed the captain. The wood in front of us is likely clear. The ebb has made a good while. Our stores should be uncovered. Volunteers to go and bring in pork. Gray and Hunter were the first to come forward. Well armed, they stole out of the stockade, but it proved a useless mission. The mutineers were bolder than we fancied, or they put more trust in Israel's gunnery. 
for four or five of them were busy carrying off our stores and waiting out with them to one of the gigs that lay close by, pulling an oar or so to hold her steady against the current. Silver was in the stern sheets in command, and every man of them was now provided with a musket from some secret magazine of their own. The captain sat down to his log. And here is the beginning of the entry. Alexander Smollett, Master, David Livesey, Ship's Doctor, Abraham Gray, Carpenter's Mate, John Trelawney, Owner, John Hunter and Richard Joyce. Owner's Servants, Landsman being all that is left faithful of the ship's company with stores for ten days at short rations, came ashore this day and flew British colors on the log house in Treasure Island. Thomas Rudruth, owner's servant, landsman, shot by the mutineers, James Hawkins. Cabin boy, and at the same time, I was wondering over poor Jim Hawkins' fate. A hail on the land side, somebody hailing us, said Hunter, who was on guard, doctor. Squire, Captain, hello, Hunter. Is that you? came the cries. And I ran to the door in time to see Jim Hawkins, safe and sound, come climbing over the stockade. 19 narrative resumed by Jim Hawkins. The garrison in the stockade, as soon as Ben Gunn saw the colors, he came to a halt, stopped me by the arm, and sat down. Now, said he, there's your friends, sure enough. Far more likely it's the mutineers, I answered, that, he cried, why, in a place like this, where nobody puts in but Jen Lemon of fortune, Silver would fly the Jolly Roger. You don't make no doubt of that. No, that's your friends. There's been blows too, and I reckon your friends has had the best of it, and here they are ashore in the old stockade, as was made years and years ago by Flint. Ah, uh, he was the man to have a headpiece, was Flint. Barring rum, his match were never seen. He were afraid of none, not he. Ani Silver Silver was that genteel. Well, said I, that may be so, and so be it. All the more reason that I should hurry on and join my friends. Nay, mate, returned Ben, not you. You're a good boy. Or I mistook, but you're Ani a boy, all told. Now, Ben gun is fly. Rum wouldn't bring me there, where you're going not rum wouldn't, till I see your born Jen Lehman and gets it on his word of honor. And you won't forget my words. A precious sight, that's what you'll say. A precious sight more confidence and then nips him. And he pinched me the third time with the same air of cleverness. And when Ben Gunn is wanted, you know where to find him, Jim. Just where you found him today. And him that comes is to have a white thing in his hand, and he's to come alone. Oh! And you'll say this. Ben Gunn, says you, has reasons of his own. Well, said I, I believe I understand. You have something to propose, and you wish to see the squire or the doctor. And you're to be found where I found you. Is that all? And when? Says you, he added. Why? From about noon observation to about six bells. Good, said I, and now may I go? You won't forget? He inquired anxiously. Precious sight and reasons of his own, says you. Reasons of his own, that's the mainstay, as between man and man. Well, then still holding me, I reckon you can go, Jim. And, Jim, if you was to see Silver, you wouldn't go for to sell Ben Gunn? Wild horses wouldn't draw it from you? No, says you. And if them pirates camp ashore, Jim, what would you say but there'd be witters in the morning? 
Here he was interrupted by a loud report, and a cannonball came tearing through the trees and pitched in the sand not a hundred yards from where we two were talking. The next moment each of us had taken to his heels in a different direction. For a good hour to come frequent reports shook the island, and balls kept crashing through the woods. I moved from hiding place to hiding place, always pursued, or so it seemed to me, by these terrifying missiles. But towards the end of the bombardment, though still I durst not venture in the direction of the stockade, where the balls fell oftenest, I had begun, in a manner, to pluck up my heart again, and after a long detour to the east, crept down among the shoreside trees. The sun had just set, the sea breeze was rustling and tumbling in the woods and ruffling the gray surface of the anchorage. The tide, too, was far out, and great tracts of sand lay uncovered. The air, after the heat of the day, chilled me through my jacket. The Hispaniola still lay where she had anchored, but, sure enough, there was the Jolly Roger the Black Flag of piracy flying from her peak. Even as I looked, there came another red flash and another report that sent the echoes clattering, and one more round shot whistled through the air. It was the last of the cannonade. I lay for some time watching the bustle which succeeded the attack. Men were demolishing something with axes on the beach near the stockade the poor jolly boat, I afterwards discovered. Away, near the mouth of the river, a great fire was glowing among the trees, and between that point and the ship one of the gigs kept coming and going, the men, whom I had seen so gloomy, shouting at the oars like children. But there was a sound in their voices which suggested rum. At length I thought I might return towards the stockade. I was pretty far down on the low. Sandy spit that encloses the anchorage to the east, and is joined at half water to Skeleton Island, and now, as I rose to my feet, I saw some distance further down the spit and rising from among low bushes, an isolated rock, pretty high and peculiarly white in color. It occurred to me that this might be the white rock of which Ben Gunn had spoken, and that some day or other a boat might be wanted, and I should know where to look for one. Then I skirted among the woods until I had regained the rear, or shoreward side, of the stockade, and was soon warmly welcomed by the faithful party. I had soon told my story and began to look about me. The log house was made of unsquared trunks of pine roof, walls, and floor. The ladder stood in several places, as much as a foot or a foot and a half above the surface of the sand. There was a porch at the door, and under this porch the little spring welled up into an artificial basin of a rather odd kind no other than a great ship's kettle of iron, with the bottom knocked out and sunk. To her bearings, as the captain said, among the sand. Little had been left besides the framework of the house, but in one corner there was a stone slab laid down by way of hearth and an old rusty iron basket to contain the fire. The slopes of the knoll and all the inside of the stockade had been cleared of timber to build the house, and we could see by the stumps what a fine and lofty grove had been destroyed. Most of the soil had been washed away or buried in drift after the removal of the trees. Only where the streamlet ran down from the kettle a thick bed of moss and some ferns and little creeping bushes were still green among the sand. Very close around the stockade too close for defense, they said the wood still flourished high and dense, all of fur on the land side but towards the sea with a large admixture of live oaks. The cold evening breeze, of which I have spoken, 
whistled through every chink of the rude building and sprinkled the floor with a continual rain of fine sand. There was sand in our eyes, sand in our teeth, sand in our suppers, sand dancing in the spring at the bottom of the kettle, for all the world like porridge beginning to boil. Our chimney was a square hole in the roof. It was but a little part of the smoke that found its way out, and the rest eddied about the house and kept us coughing and piping the eye. Add to this that Gray, the new man, had his face tied up in a bandage for a cut he had gotten breaking away from the mutineers, and that poor old Tom Redruth, still unburied, lay along the wall, stiff and stark. Under the Union Jack, if we had been allowed to sit idle, we should all have fallen in the blues, but Captain Smollett was never the man for that. All hands were called up before him, and he divided us into watches. The doctor and Gray and I for one, the squire, Hunter, and Joyce upon the other. Tired though we all were, two were sent out for firewood. Two more were set to dig a grave for Ridruth. The doctor was named Cook. I was put sentry at the door, and the captain himself went from one to another keeping up our spirits and lending a hand wherever it was wanted. From time to time the doctor came to the door for a little air and to rest his eyes, which were almost smoked out of his head, and whenever he did so, he had a word for me. That man Smollett, he said once, is a better man than I am. And when I say that it means a deal, Jim, Another time he came and was silent for a while. Then he put his head on one side and looked at me. Is this Ben Gunn a man? He asked. I do not know, sir, said I. I am not very sure whether he's sane. If there's any doubt about the matter, he is, returned the doctor. A man who has been three years biting his nails on a desert island, Jim, can't expect to appear as sane as you or me. It doesn't lie in human nature. Was it cheese you said he had a fancy for? Yes, sir, cheese, I answered. Well, Jim, says he, just see the good that comes of being dainty in your food. You've seen my snuff box, haven't you? And you never saw me take snuff. The reason being that in my snuff box I carry a piece of Parmesan cheese a cheese made in Italy, very nutritious. Well, that's for Ben Gunn. Before supper was eaten we buried old Tom in the sand and stood round him for a while bareheaded in the breeze. A good deal of firewood had been got in, but not enough for the captain's fancy and he shook his head over it and told us we must get back to this tomorrow rather livelier. Then, when we had eaten our pork and each had a good stiff glass of brandy grog, the three chiefs got together in a corner to discuss our prospects. It appears they were at their wits end what to do, the stores being so low that we must have been starved into surrender long before help came but our best hope, it was decided, was to kill off the buccaneers until they either hauled down their flag or ran away with the Hispaniola. From 19, they were already reduced to 15. Two others were wounded, and one at least the man shot beside the gun severely wounded if he were not dead. Every time we had a crack at them, we were to take it, saving our own lives with the extremest care. And besides that, we had two able allies, Rum and the Climate. As for the first, though we were about half a mile away, we could hear them roaring and singing late into the night. And as for the second, the doctor staked his wig that, camped where they were in the marsh and unprovided with remedies, the half of them would be on their backs before a week. So. He added, If we are not all shot down first, they'll be glad to be packing in the schooner. 
It's always a ship, and they can get to buccaneering again, I suppose. First ship that ever I lost, said Captain Smollett. I was dead tired, as you may fancy, and when I got to sleep, which was not till after a great deal of tossing, I slept like a log of wood. The rest had long been up and had already breakfasted and increased the pile of firewood by about half as much again when I was wakened by a bustle and the sound of voices, flag of truce. I heard someone say, and then, immediately after, with a cry of surprise, Silver himself. And at that, up I jumped and, rubbing my eyes, ran to a loophole in the wall. XX Silver's embassy, sure enough, there were two men just outside the stockade, one of them waving a white cloth, the other, no less a person than Silver himself, standing placidly by. It was still quite early, and the coldest morning that I think I ever was abroad in a chill that pierced into the marrow. The sky was bright and cloudless overhead, and the tops of the trees shone rosily in the sun. But where Silver stood with his lieutenant, all was still in shadow. And they waded knee-deep in a low white vapor that had crawled during the night out of the morass. The chill and the vapor taken together told a poor tale of the island. It was plainly a damp, feverish, unhealthy spot. Keep indoors, men, said the captain. Ten to one this is a trick. Then he hailed the buccaneer. Who goes? Stand or we fire. Flag of truce, cried Silver. The captain was in the porch, keeping himself carefully out of the way of a treacherous shot, should any be intended. He turned and spoke to us. Doctors watch on the lookout. Dr. Livesey, take the north side, if you please. Jim, the east, gray, west. The watch below, all hands to load muskets. Lively, men, and careful. And then he turned again to the mutineers. And what do you want with your flag of truce? He cried. This time it was the other man who replied, Captain Silver, sir, to come on board and make terms. He shouted, Captain Silver don't know him. Who's he? cried the captain. And we could hear him adding to himself, Captain, is it? My heart, and here's promotion. Long John answered for himself, me, sir. These poor lads have chosen me, captain. After your desertion, sir, laying a particular emphasis upon the word desertion, we're willing to submit if we can come to terms and no bones about it. All I ask is your word, Captain Smollett, to let me safe and sound out of this here stockade and one minute to get out O shot before a gun is fired. My man, said Captain Smollett, I have not the slightest desire to talk to you. If you wish to talk to me, you can come, that's all. If there's any treachery, It'll be on your side, and the Lord help you. That's enough, Captain, shouted Long John cheerily. A word from you's enough. I know a gentleman, and you may lay to that. We could see the man who carried the flag of truce attempting to hold Silver back. Nor was that wonderful. Seeing how cavalier had been the captain's answer, but Silver laughed at him aloud and slapped him on the back as if the idea of alarm had been absurd. Then he advanced to the stockade, threw over his crutch, got a leg up, and with great vigor and skill succeeded in surmounting the fence and dropping safely to the other side. I will confess that I was far too much taken up with what was going on to be of the slightest use as sentry, indeed. I had already deserted my eastern loophole and crept up behind the captain, who had now seated himself on the threshold, with his elbows on his knees, his head in his hands. 
and his eyes fixed on the water as it bubbled out of the old iron kettle in the sand. He was whistling, come, lasses and lads. Silver had terrible hard work getting up the knoll. What with the steepness of the incline, the thick tree stumps, and the soft sand, he and his crutch were as helpless as a ship in stays. But he stuck to it like a man in silence, and at last arrived before the captain, whom he saluted in the handsomest style. He was tricked out in his vest, an immense blue coat, thick with brass buttons, hung as low as to his knees and a fine laced hat was set on the back of his head. Here you are, my man, said the captain, raising his head. You had better sit down. You ain't a going to let me inside, captain, complained Long John. It's a main cold morning, to be sure, sir, to sit outside upon the sand. Why, Silver, said the captain, if you would please to be an honest man, you might have been sitting in your galley. It's your own doing. You're either my ship's cook and then you were treated handsome or Captain Silver, a common mutineer and pirate, and then you can go hang. Well, well, Captain. Return the sea cook. Sitting down as he was bidden on the sand, you'll have to give me a hand up again. That's all. A sweet pretty place you have of it here. Ah, uh, there's Jim. The top of the morning to you, Jim. Doctor, here's my service. Why, there you all are together like a happy family, in a manner of speaking. If you have anything to say, my man, better say it. Said the captain, right you were. Captain Smollett replied silver, duty is duty, to be sure. Well now, you look here. That was a good lay of yours last night. I don't deny it was a good lay. Some of you pretty handy with a hand spike end. And I'll not deny neither, but what some of my people was shook maybe all was shook. Maybe I was shook myself. Maybe that's why I'm here for terms. But you mark me, Captain, it won't do twice, by thunder. We'll have to do sentry go and ease off a point or so on the rum. Maybe you think we were all a sheet in the wind's eye, but I'll tell you I was sober. I was awny dog tired, and if I'd awoke a second sooner, I'd a caught you at the act, I would. He wasn't dead when I got round to him, not he. Well, says Captain Smollett as cool as can be. All that Silver said was a riddle to him, but you would never have guessed it from his tone. As for me, I began to have an inkling. Ben Gunn's last words came back to my mind. I began to suppose that he had paid the buccaneers a visit while they all lay drunk together round their fire, and I reckoned up with glee that we had only fourteen enemies to deal with. Well, here it is, said Silver. We want that treasure, and we'll have it that's our point. You would just as soon save your lives, I reckon, and that's yours. You have a chart, haven't you? That's as may be, replied the captain. Oh, well, you have, I know that, returned Long John. You needn't be so husky with a man. There ain't a particle of service in that, and you may lay to it. What I mean is, we want your chart. Now, I never met you no harm myself. That won't do with me, my man, interrupted the captain. We know exactly what you meant to do, and we don't care, for now. You see, you can't do it. And the captain looked at him calmly and proceeded to fill a pipe. If Abe Gray, Silver broke out, avast there, cried Mr. Smollett. Gray told me nothing. And I asked him nothing, and what's more, I would see you and him and this whole island blown clean out of the water into blazes first. So there's my mind for you, my man, on that. This little whiff of temper seemed to cool Silver down. He had been growing nettled before, but now he pulled himself together. Like enough, said he. 
I would set no limits to what gentlemen might consider shipshape, or might not, as the case were. And seein' as how you are about to take a pipe, Captain, I'll make so free as do likewise. And he filled a pipe and lighted it, and the two men sat silently smoking for quite a while, now looking each other in the face, now stopping their tobacco, now leaning forward to spit. It was as good as the play to see them. Now, resumed Silver, here it is. You give us the chart to get the treasure by, and drop shooting poor seamen and stoving of their heads in while asleep. You do that, and we'll offer you a choice. Either you come aboard along of us, once the treasure shipped, and then I'll give you my affidavy, upon my word of honor, to clap you somewhere safe ashore. Or, if that ain't to your fancy, some of my hands being rough and having old scores on account of hazing, then you can stay here, you can. We'll divide stores with you, man for man, and I'll give my affidavy, as before to speak the first ship I sight, and send M here to pick you up. Now you'll own that's talking. Handsomer you couldn't look to get, now you. And I hope, raising his voice, that all hands in this here block house will overhaul my words, for what is spoke to one is spoke to all. Captain Smollett rose from his seat and knocked out the ashes of his pipe in the palm of his left hand. Is that all? He asked. Every last word. By thunder, answered John. Refuse that. And you've seen the last of me but musket balls. Very good, said the captain. Now you'll hear me. If you'll come up one by one, unarmed. I'll engage to clap you all in irons and take you home to a fair trial in England. If you won't, my name is Alexander Smollett. I've flown my sovereign's colors, and I'll see you all to Davy Jones. You can't find the treasure. You can't sail the ship. There's not a man among you fit to sail the ship. You can't fight us, Gray. There, got away from five of you. Your ship's in irons, Master Silver. You're on a lee shore, and so you'll find. I stand here and tell you so, and they're the last good words you'll get from me, for in the name of heaven, I'll put a bullet in your back when next I meet you. Tramp, my lad. Bundle out of this, please, hand over hand, and double quick. Silver's face was a picture, his eyes started in his head with wrath. He shook the fire out of his pipe, give me a hand up. He cried, not I, returned the captain. Who'll give me a hand up? He roared. Not a man among us moved, growling the foulest imprecations. He crawled along the sand till he got hold of the porch and could hoist himself again upon his crutch. Then he spat into the spring. There, he cried, that's what I think of ye. Before an hour's out, I'll stove in your old block house like a rum puncheon. Laugh, by thunder, laugh. Before an hour's out, you'll laugh upon the other side. Them that dial be the lucky ones. And with a dreadful oath he stumbled off, plowed down the sand, was helped across the stockade, after four or five failures, by the man with the flag of truce, and disappeared in an instant afterwards among the trees. XXI the attack as soon as Silver disappeared, the captain, who had been closely watching him, turned towards the interior of the house and found not a man of us at his post but Gray. It was the first time we had ever seen him angry. Quarters, he roared. And then, as we all slunk back to our places, Gray, he said, I'll put your name in the log. You've stood by your duty like a seaman. Mr. Trelawney, I'm surprised at you, sir. Doctor, I thought you had worn the king's coat. If that was how you served at Fontenoy, sir, you'd have been better in your berth. 
the doctor's watch were all back at their loopholes. The rest were busy loading the spare muskets and everyone with a red face, you may be certain, and a flea in his ear, as the saying is. The captain looked on for a while in silence. Then he spoke. My lads, said he, I've given silver a broadside. I pitched it in red hot on purpose, and before the hour's out, as he said, we shall be boarded. We're outnumbered. I needn't tell you that, but we fight in shelter, and a minute ago I should have said we fought with discipline. I've no manner of doubt that we can drub them, if you choose. Then he went the rounds and saw, as he said, that all was clear. On the two short sides of the house, east and west, there were only two loopholes. On the south side where the porch was, two again. And on the north side, five. There was a round score of muskets for the seven of us. The firewood had been built into four piles tables. You might say one about the middle of each side. And on each of these tables some ammunition and four loaded muskets were laid ready to the hand of the defenders. In the middle, the cutlasses lay ranged, toss out the fire. Said the captain, the chill is past and we mustn't have smoke in our eyes. The iron fire basket was carried bodily out by Mr. Trelawney and the embers smothered among sand. Hawkins hasn't had his breakfast. Hawkins, help yourself and back to your post to eat it, continued Captain Smollett. Lively now, my lad. You'll want it before you've done. Hunter. Serve out a round of brandy to all hands. And while this was going on, the captain completed, in his own mind, the plan of the defense. Doctor, you will take the door, he resumed. See. And don't expose yourself. Keep within and fire through the porch. Hunter, take the east side there. Joyce, you stand by the west, my man. Mr. Trelawney. You are the best shot you and Gray will take this long north side with the five loopholes. It's there the danger is. If they can get up to it and fire in upon us through our own ports, things would begin to look dirty. Hawkins, neither you nor I are much account at the shooting. We'll stand by to load and bear a hand. As the captain had said, the chill was past. As soon as the sun had climbed above our girdle of trees, it fell with all its force upon the clearing and drank up the vapors at a draft. Soon the sand was baking and the resin melting in the logs of the blockhouse. Jackets and coats were flung aside, shirts thrown open at the neck and rolled up to the shoulders. And we stood there, each at his post, in a fever of heat and anxiety. An hour passed away. Hang them, said the captain. This is as dull as the doldrums. Gray, whistle for a wind. And just at that moment came the first news of the attack. If you please, sir, said Joyce, if I see anyone, am I to fire? I told you so, cried the captain. Thank you, sir. Returned Joyce with the same quiet civility. Nothing followed for a time, but the remark had set us all on the alert. Straining ears and eyes the musketeers with their pieces balanced in their hands, the captain out in the middle of the blockhouse with his mouth very tight and a frown on his face. So some seconds passed till suddenly Joyce whipped up his musket and fired. The report had scarcely died away ere it was repeated and repeated from without in a scattering volley. Shot behind shot, like a string of geese, from every side of the enclosure. Several bullets struck the log house, but not one entered, and as the smoke cleared away and vanished, the stockade and the woods around it looked as quiet and empty as before. Not a bow waved, 
Not the gleam of a musket barrel betrayed the presence of our foes. Did you hit your man? Asked the captain. No, sir, replied Joyce. I believe not, sir. Next best thing to tell the truth, muttered Captain Smollett. Load his gun, Hawkins. How many should say there were on your side? Doctor. I know precisely, said Dr. Livesey. Three shots were fired on this side. I saw the three flashes too close together, one farther to the west. Three, repeated the captain. And how many on yours, Mr. Trelawney? But this was not so easily answered. There had come many from the North Seven by the squire's computation, eight or nine according to Gray. From the east and west only a single shot had been fired. It was plain, therefore, that the attack would be developed from the north and that on the other three sides we were only to be annoyed by a show of hostilities. But Captain Smollett made no change in his arrangements. If the mutineers succeeded in crossing the stockade, he argued, they would take possession of any unprotected loophole and shoot us down like rats in our own stronghold. Nor had we much time left to us for thought. Suddenly, with a loud huzzah, a little cloud of pirates leaped from the woods on the north side and ran straight on the stockade. At the same moment, the fire was once more opened from the woods, and a rifle ball sang through the doorway and knocked the doctor's musket into bits. The boarders swarmed over the fence like monkeys. Squire and Gray fired again and yet again. Three men fell, one forwards into the enclosure, two back on the outside. But of these, one was evidently more frightened than hurt. For he was on his feet again in a crack and instantly disappeared among the trees. Two had bit the dust, one had fled, for had made good their footing inside our defenses. While from the shelter of the woods seven or eight men, each evidently supplied with several muskets, kept up a hot though useless fire on the log house. The four who had boarded made straight before them for the building, shouting as they ran, and the men among the trees shouted back to encourage them. Several shots were fired. But such was the hurry of the marksmen that not one appears to have taken effect. In a moment, the four pirates had swarmed up the mound and were upon us. The head of Job Anderson. The bosun appeared at the middle loophole. At M, all hands, all hands, he roared in a voice of thunder. At the same moment, another pirate grasped Hunter's musket by the muzzle, wrenched it from his hands, plucked it through the loophole, and with one stunning blow, laid the poor fellow senseless on the floor. Meanwhile, a third, running unharmed all around the house, appeared suddenly in the doorway and fell with his cutlass on the doctor. Our position was utterly reversed. A moment since we were firing, under cover at an exposed enemy, now it was we who lay uncovered and could not return a blow. The log house was full of smoke, to which we owed our comparative safety. Cries and confusion. The flashes and reports of pistol shots and one loud groan rang in my ears. Out, lads, out and fight em in the open. Cutlasses, cried the captain. I snatched a cutlass from the pile and someone, at the same time snatching another, gave me a cut across the knuckles which I hardly felt. I dashed out of the door into the clear sunlight. Someone was close behind. I knew not whom. Right in front, the doctor was pursuing his assailant down the hill, and just as my eyes fell upon him, beat down his guard and sent him sprawling on his back with a great slash across the face, round the house, lads, round the house, cried the captain, 
and even in the hurly-burly. I perceived a change in his voice. Mechanically, I obeyed, turned eastwards, and with my cutlass raised, ran round the corner of the house. Next moment, I was face to face with Anderson. He roared aloud, and his hanger went up above his head, flashing in the sunlight. I had not time to be afraid, but as the blow still hung impending, leaped in a trice upon one side, and missing my foot in the soft sand, rolled headlong down the slope. When I had first sallied from the door, the other mutineers had been already swarming up the palisade to make an end of us. One man, in a red nightcap, with his cutlass in his mouth, had even got upon the top and thrown a leg across. Well, so short had been the interval that when I found my feet again, all was in the same posture, the fellow with the red nightcap still halfway over, another still just showing his head above the top of the stockade. And yet, in this breath of time, the fight was over and the victory was ours. Gray, following close behind me, had cut down the big bosun ere he had time to recover from his last blow. Another had been shot at a loophole in the very act of firing into the house and now lay in agony, the pistol still smoking in his hand. A third, as I had seen, the doctor had disposed of at a blow. Of the four who had scaled the palisade, one only remained unaccounted for, and he, having left his cutlass on the field, was now clambering out again with the fear of death upon him. Fire, fire from the house, cried the doctor, and you, lads, back into cover. But his words were unheeded. No shot was fired, and the last boarder made good his escape and disappeared with the rest into the wood. In three seconds, nothing remained of the attacking party but the five who had fallen, four on the inside and one on the outside of the palisade. The doctor and Gray and I ran full speed for shelter. The survivors would soon be back where they had left their muskets, and at any moment the fire might recommence. The house was by this time somewhat cleared of smoke, and we saw at a glance the price we had paid for victory. Hunter lay beside his loophole, stunned, Joyce by his, shot through the head. Never to move again, while right in the center, the squire was supporting the captain, one as pale as the other. The captain's wounded, said Mr. Trelawney. Have they run? asked Mr. Smollett. All that could, you may be bound, returned the doctor, but there's five of them will never run again. Five? cried the captain. Come, that's better. Five against three leaves us four to nine. That's better odds than we had at starting. We were seven to nineteen then, or thought we were, and that's as bad to bear. Asterisk, asterisk, the mutineers were soon only eight in number, for the man shot by Mr. Trelawney on board the schooner died that same evening of his wound. But this was, of course, not known till after by the faithful party. Part 5 My Sea Adventure XXI How I began my sea adventure there was no return of the mutineers not so much as another shot out of the woods. They had got their rations for that day. As the captain put it, and we had the place to ourselves and a quiet time to overhaul the wounded and get dinner. Squire and I cooked outside in spite of the danger. And even outside, we could hardly tell what we were at, for horror of the loud groans that reached us from the doctor's patients. Out of the eight men who had fallen in the action, only three still breathed that one of the pirates who had been shot at the loophole, Hunter and Captain Smollett, and of these, the first two were as good as dead. The mutineer indeed died under the doctor's knife, and Hunter, D. 
do what we could, never recovered consciousness in this world. He lingered all day. Breathing loudly like the old buccaneer at home in his apoplectic fit, but the bones of his chest had been crushed by the blow and his skull fractured in falling. And sometime in the following night, without sign or sound, he went to his maker. As for the captain, his wounds were grievous indeed, but not dangerous. No organ was fatally injured. Anderson's ball for it was job that shot him first had broken his shoulder blade and touched the lung, not badly. The second had only torn and displaced some muscles in the calf. He was sure to recover, the doctor said, but in the meantime, and for weeks to come, he must not walk nor move his arm, nor so much as speak when he could help it. My own accidental cut across the knuckles was a flea bite. Dr. Livesey patched it up with plaster and pulled my ears for me into the bargain. After dinner, the squire and the doctor sat by the captain's side a while in consultation, and when they had talked to their heart's content, it being then a little past noon, the doctor took up his hat and pistols, gird on a cutlass, put the chart in his pocket, and with a musket over his shoulder crossed the palisade on the north side and set off briskly through the trees. Gray and I were sitting together at the far end of the blockhouse to be out of earshot of our officers consulting, and Gray took his pipe out of his mouth and fairly forgot to put it back again, so thunderstruck he was at this occurrence. Why? In the name of Davy Jones, said he, is Dr. Livesey mad? Why no, says I, he's about the last of this crew for that, I take it. Well, shipmate, said Gray, mad he may not be, but if he's not, you mark my words, I am. I take it, replied I, the doctor has his idea, and if I am right, he's going now to see Ben Gunn. I was right, as appeared later, but in the meantime. The house being stifling hot, and the little patch of sand inside the palisade ablaze with midday sun, I began to get another thought into my head, which was not by any means so right. What I began to do was to envy the doctor walking in the cool shadow of the woods with the birds about him and the pleasant smell of the pines, while I sat grilling. With my clothes stuck to the hot resin, and so much blood about me and so many poor dead bodies lying all around that I took a disgust of the place that was almost as strong as fear. All the time I was washing out the blockhouse and then washing up the things from dinner, this disgust and envy kept growing stronger and stronger, till at last, being near a bread bag. And no one then observing me, I took the first step towards my escapade and filled both pockets of my coat with biscuit. I was a fool, if you like, and certainly I was going to do a foolish, overbold act, but I was determined to do it with all the precautions in my power. These biscuits, should anything befall me, would keep me, at least, from starving till far on in the next day. The next thing I laid hold of was a brace of pistols, and as I already had a powder horn and bullets, I felt myself well supplied with arms. As for the scheme I had in my head, it was not a bad one in itself. I was to go down the sandy spit that divides the anchorage on the east from the open sea, find the white rock I had observed last evening, and ascertain whether it was there or not that Ben Gunn had hidden his boat, a thing quite worth doing, as I still believe. But as I was certain I should not be allowed to leave the enclosure, my only plan was to take French leave and slip out when nobody was watching. And that was so bad a way of doing it as made the thing itself wrong. But I was only a boy, and I had made my mind up. Well, 
As things at last fell out, I found an admirable opportunity. The squire and Gray were busy helping the captain with his bandages. The coast was clear. I made a bolt for it over the stockade and into the thickest of the trees. And before my absence was observed, I was out of cry of my companions. This was my second folly, far worse than the first, as I left but two sound men to guard the house, but like the first. It was a help towards saving all of us. I took my way straight for the east coast of the island, for I was determined to go down the sea side of the spit to avoid all chance of observation from the anchorage. It was already late in the afternoon, although still warm and sunny. As I continued to thread the tall woods, I could hear from far before me not only the continuous thunder of the surf, but a certain tossing of foliage and grinding of boughs which showed me the sea breeze had set in higher than usual. Soon cool drafts of air began to reach me, and a few steps farther I came forth into the open borders of the grove and saw the sea lying blue and sunny to the horizon and the surf tumbling and tossing its foam along the beach. I have never seen the sea quiet round Treasure Island. The sun might blaze overhead, the air be without a breath, the surface smooth and blue. But still these great rollers would be running along all the external coast, thundering and thundering by day and night. And I scarce believe there is one spot in the island where a man would be out of earshot of their noise. I walked along beside the surf with great enjoyment, till, thinking I was now got far enough to the south, I took the cover of some thick bushes and crept warily up to the ridge of the spit. Behind me was the sea, in front the anchorage. The sea breeze. As though it had the sooner blown itself out by its unusual violence, was already at an end. It had been succeeded by light, variable airs from the south and southeast, carrying great banks of fog and the anchorage under lee of Skeleton Island lay still and leaden as when first we entered it. The Hispaniola in that unbroken mirror was exactly portrayed from the truck to the waterline, the Jolly Roger hanging from her peak. Alongside lay one of the gigs. Silver in the stern sheets him I could always recognize while a couple of men were leaning over the stern bulwarks. One of them with a red cap the very rogue that I had seen some hours before stride legs upon the palisade. Apparently they were talking and laughing. Though at that distance upwards of a mile I could, of course, hear no word of what was said. All at once there began the most horrid, unearthly screaming, which at first startled me badly. Though I had soon remembered the voice of Captain Flint, and even thought I could make out the bird by her bright plumage as she sat perched upon her master's wrist. Soon after, the jolly boat shoved off and pulled for shore, and the man with the red cap and his comrade went below by the cabin companion. Just about the same time. The sun had gone down behind the spyglass, and as the fog was collecting rapidly, it began to grow dark in earnest. I saw I must lose no time if I were to find the boat that evening. The white rock, visible enough above the brush, was still some eighth of a mile further down the spit, and it took me a goodish while to get up with it, crawling, often on all fours. Among the scrub, night had almost come when I laid my hand on its rough sides. Right below it there was an exceedingly small hollow of green turf, hidden by banks and a thick underwood about knee-deep that grew there very plentifully, and in the center of the dell, sure enough, a little tent of goatskins, like what the gypsies carry about with them in England. I dropped into the hollow, lifted the side of the tent, 
And there was Ben Gunn's boat homemade, if ever anything was homemade, a rude, lopsided framework of tough wood and stretched upon that a covering of goatskin with the hair inside. The thing was extremely small, even for me. And I can hardly imagine that it could have floated with a full-sized man. There was one thwart set as low as possible, a kind of stretcher in the bows, and a double paddle for propulsion. I had not then seen a coracle, such as the ancient Britons made, but I have seen one since. And I can give you no fairer idea of Ben Gunn's boat than by saying it was like the first and the worst coracle ever made by man. But the great advantage of the coracle it certainly possessed, for it was exceedingly light and portable. Well, now that I had found the boat, you would have thought I had had enough of truantry for once, but in the meantime I had taken another notion and become so obstinately fond of it that I would have carried it out. I believe in the teeth of Captain Smollett himself. This was to slip out under cover of the night, cut the Hispaniola adrift, and let her go ashore where she fancied. I had quite made up my mind that the mutineers, after their repulse of the morning, had nothing nearer their hearts than to up anchor and away to sea. This I thought. It would be a fine thing to prevent, and now that I had seen how they left their watchmen unprovided with a boat, I thought it might be done with little risk. Down I sat to wait for darkness, and made a hearty meal of biscuit. It was a night out of ten thousand for my purpose. The fog had now buried all heaven. As the last rays of daylight dwindled and disappeared, absolute blackness settled down on Treasure Island. And when, at last, I shouldered the coracle and groped my way stumblingly out of the hollow where I had supped, there were but two points visible on the whole anchorage. One was the great fire on shore, by which the defeated pirates lay carousing in the swamp. The other, a mere blur of light upon the darkness, indicated the position of the anchored ship. She had swung round to the ebb her bow was now towards me the only lights on board were in the cabin, and what I saw was merely a reflection on the fog of the strong rays that flowed from the stern window. The ebb had already run some time, and I had to wade through a long belt of swampy sand, where I sank several times above the ankle, before I came to the edge of the retreating water, and, wading a little way in, with some strength and dexterity, set my coracle keel downwards. On the surface, Exei the ebb tide runs the coracle as I had ample reason to know before I was done with her was a very safe boat for a person of my height and weight. Both buoyant and clever in a seaway, but she was the most cross-grained, lopsided craft to manage. Do as you pleased, she always made more leeway than anything else. And turning round and round was the maneuver she was best at. Even Ben Gunn himself has admitted that she was queer to handle till you knew her way. Certainly, I did not know her way. She turned in every direction, but the one I was bound to go, the most part of the time we were broadside on, and I am very sure I never should have made the ship at all but for the tide. By good fortune, paddle as I pleased, the tide was still sweeping me down, and there lay the Hispaniola right in the fairway, hardly to be missed. First she loomed before me like a blot of something yet blacker than darkness, then her spars and hull began to take shape, and the next moment, as it seemed, for the farther I went, the brisker grew the current of the ebb, I was alongside of her hawser and had laid hold. The hawser was as taut as a bowstring, and the current so strong she pulled upon her anchor. All round the hull, in the blackness, 
The rippling current bubbled and chattered like a little mountain stream. One cut with my sea gully and the Hispaniola would go humming down the tide. So far so good, but it next occurred to my recollection that a taut hawser, suddenly cut, is a thing as dangerous as a kicking horse. Ten to one, if I were so foolhardy as to cut the Hispaniola from her anchor, I and the coracle would be knocked clean out of the water. This brought me to a full stop, and if fortune had not again particularly favored me, I should have had to abandon my design. But the light airs which had begun blowing from the southeast and south had hauled round after nightfall into the southwest. Just while I was meditating, a puff came, caught the Hispaniola, and forced her up into the current, and to my great joy, I felt the hawser slacken in my grasp, and the hand by which I held it dip for a second under water. With that I made my mind up, took out my gully, opened it with my teeth, and cut one strand after another, till the vessel swung only by two. Then I lay quiet, waiting to sever these last when the strain should be once more lightened by a breath of wind. All this time I had heard the sound of loud voices from the cabin, but to say truth, my mind had been so entirely taken up with other thoughts that I had scarcely given ear. Now, however, when I had nothing else to do, I began to pay more heed. One I recognized for the coxswain's Israel hands that had been Flint's gunner in former days. The other was, of course, my friend of the red nightcap. Both men were plainly the worse of drink, and they were still drinking, for even while I was listening, one of them, with a drunken cry, opened the stern window and threw out something, which I divined to be an empty bottle. But they were not only tipsy, it was plain that they were furiously angry. Oaths flew like hailstones. And every now and then there came forth such an explosion as I thought was sure to end in blows. But each time the quarrel passed off and the voices grumbled lower for a while, until the next crisis came and in its turn passed away without result. On shore, I could see the glow of the great campfire burning warmly through the shoreside trees. Someone was singing a dull, old, droning sailor song, with a droop and a quaver at the end of every verse, and seemingly no end to it at all but the patience of the singer. I had heard it on the voyage more than once and remembered these words, but one man of her crew alive, what put to sea with seventy-five. And I thought it was a ditty rather too dolefully appropriate for a company that had met such cruel losses in the morning. But, indeed, from what I saw, all these buccaneers were as callous as the sea they sailed on. At last the breeze came, the schooner sidled and drew nearer in the dark. I felt the hawser slacken once more and with a good, tough effort, cut the last fibers through. The breeze had but little action on the coracle, and I was almost instantly swept against the bows of the Hispaniola. At the same time, the schooner began to turn upon her heel, spinning slowly, end for end, across the current. I wrought like a fiend, for I expected every moment to be swamped. And since I found I could not push the coracle directly off, I now shoved straight astern. At length I was clear of my dangerous neighbor, and just as I gave the last impulsion, my hands came across a light cord that was trailing overboard across the stern bulwarks. Instantly I grasped it. Why I should have done so I can hardly say. It was at first mere instinct. But once I had it in my hands and found it fast, curiosity began to get the upper hand, and I determined I should have one look through the cabin window. I pulled in hand over hand on the cord, and when I judged myself near enough, 
rose at infinite risk to about half my height and thus commanded the roof and a slice of the interior of the cabin. By this time the schooner and her little consort were gliding pretty swiftly through the water. Indeed, we had already fetched up level with the campfire. The ship was talking. As sailors say, loudly, treading the innumerable ripples with an incessant weltering splash. And until I got my eye above the windowsill, I could not comprehend why the watchman had taken no alarm. One glance, however, was sufficient. And it was only one glance that I durst take from that unsteady skiff. It showed me hands and his companion locked together in deadly wrestle, each with a hand upon the other's throat. I dropped upon the thwart again, none too soon, for I was near overboard. I could see nothing for the moment but these two furious, and crimsoned faces swaying together under the smoky lamp, and I shut my eyes to let them grow once more familiar with the darkness. The endless ballad had come to an end at last and the whole diminished company about the campfire had broken into the chorus I had heard so often, fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, -ho, and a bottle of rum. Drink and the devil had done for the rest, yo-ho-ho, -ho, and a bottle of rum. I was just thinking how busy drink and the devil were at that very moment in the cabin of the Hispaniola, when I was surprised by a sudden lurch of the coracle. At the same moment, she yawed sharply and seemed to change her course. The speed in the meantime had strangely increased. I opened my eyes at once. All round me were little ripples, combing over with a sharp, bristling sound and slightly phosphorescent. The Hispaniola herself, a few yards in whose wake I was still being whirled along, seemed to stagger in her course, and I saw her spars toss a little against the blackness of the night, nay, as I looked longer. I made sure she also was wheeling to the southward. I glanced over my shoulder, and my heart jumped against my ribs. There, right behind me, was the glow of the campfire. The current had turned at right angles, sweeping round along with it the tall schooner and the little dancing coracle, ever quickening, ever bubbling higher, ever muttering louder. It went spinning through the narrows for the open sea. Suddenly the schooner in front of me gave a violent yaw, turning, perhaps, through twenty degrees. And almost at the same moment one shout followed another from on board. I could hear feet pounding on the companion ladder, and I knew that the two drunkards had at last been interrupted in their quarrel and awakened to a sense of their disaster. I lay down flat in the bottom of that wretched skiff and devoutly recommended my spirit to its maker. At the end of the straits, I made sure we must fall into some bar of raging breakers, where all my troubles would be ended speedily, and though I could, perhaps, bear to die, I could not bear to look upon my fate as it approached. So I must have lain for hours, continually beaten to and fro upon the billows, now and again wetted with flying sprays and never ceasing to expect death at the next plunge. Gradually weariness grew upon me. A numbness, an occasional stupor, fell upon my mind even in the midst of my terrors. Until sleep at last supervened, and in my sea-tossed coracle I lay and dreamed of home and the old Admiral Benbow. Ziv the cruise of the coracle it was broad day when I awoke and found myself tossing at the southwest end of Treasure Island. The sun was up but was still hid from me behind the great bulk of the spyglass, which on this side descended almost to the sea in formidable cliffs. Halbeline Head and Mizzenmist Hill were at my elbow, the hill bare and dark, 
the head bound with cliffs 40 or 50 feet high and fringed with great masses of fallen rock. I was scarce a quarter of a mile to seaward, and it was my first thought to paddle in and land. That notion was soon given over. Among the fallen rocks the breakers spouted and bellowed. Loud reverberations, heavy sprays flying and falling, succeeded one another from second to second, and I saw myself if I ventured nearer. Dashed to death upon the rough shore or spending my strength in vain to scale the beetling crags. Nor was that all. For crawling together on flat tables of rock or letting themselves drop into the sea with loud reports, I beheld huge slimy monster soft snails, as it were, of incredible bigness too, or three score of them together, making the rocks to echo with their barkings. I have understood since that they were sea lions and entirely harmless. But the look of them, added to the difficulty of the shore and the high running of the surf, was more than enough to disgust me of that landing place. I felt willing rather to starve at sea than to confront such perils. In the meantime, I had a better chance, as I supposed, before me. North of Halbeline Head, the land runs in a long way, leaving at low tide a long stretch of yellow sand. To the north of that, again, there comes another Cape Cape of the woods, as it was marked upon the chart buried in tall green pines, which descended to the margin of the sea. I remembered what Silver had said about the current that sets northward along the whole west coast of Treasure Island, and seeing from my position that I was already under its influence, I preferred to leave Halbeline head behind me and reserve my strength for an attempt to land upon the kindlier-looking cape of the woods. There was a great, smooth swell upon the sea. The wind blowing steady and gentle from the south, there was no contrariety between that and the current, and the billows rose and fell unbroken. Had it been otherwise, I must long ago have perished, but as it was, it is surprising how easily and securely my little and light boat could ride. Often, as I still lay at the bottom and kept no more than an eye above the gunwale, I would see a big blue summit heaving close above me, yet the coracle would but bounce a little, dance as if on springs, and subside on the other side into the trough as lightly as a bird. I began after a little to grow very bold and sat up to try my skill at paddling. But even a small change in the disposition of the weight will produce violent changes in the behavior of a coracle. And I had hardly moved before the boat, giving up at once her gentle dancing movement, ran straight down a slope of water so steep that it made me giddy and struck her nose with a spout of spray, deep into the side of the next wave. I was drenched and terrified and fell instantly back into my old position, whereupon the coracle seemed to find her head again and led me as softly as before among the billows. It was plain she was not to be interfered with and at that rate. Since I could in no way influence her course, what hope had I left of reaching land? I began to be horribly frightened, but I kept my head for all that. First, moving with all care, I gradually bailed out the coracle with my sea cap. Then, getting my eye once more above the gunwale, I set myself to study how it was she managed to slip so quietly through the rollers. I found each wave, instead of the big, smooth glossy mountain it looks from shore or from a vessel's deck was for all the world like any range of hills on dry land full of peaks and smooth places and valleys the coracle left to herself turning from side to side threaded so to speak 
Her way through these lower parts and avoided the steep slopes and higher, toppling summits of the wave, well, now, thought I to myself. It is plain I must lie where I am and not disturb the balance, but it is plain also that I can put the paddle over the side and from time to time in smooth places. Give her a shove or two towards land. No sooner thought upon than done. There I lay on my elbows in the most trying attitude, and every now and again gave a weak stroke or two to turn her head to shore. It was very tiring and slow work, yet I did visibly gain ground, and as we drew near the Cape of the Woods. Though I saw I must infallibly miss that point, I had still made some hundred yards of easting. I was, indeed, close in. I could see the cool green treetops swaying together in the breeze, and I felt sure I should make the next promontory without fail. It was high time, for I now began to be tortured with thirst. The glow of the sun from above, its thousandfold reflection from the waves, the seawater that fell and dried upon me, caking my very lips with salt, combined to make my throat burn and my brain ache. The sight of the trees so near at hand had almost made me sick with longing, but the current had soon carried me past the point, and as the next reach of sea opened out, I beheld a sight that changed the nature of my thoughts. Right in front of me, not half a mile away, I beheld the Hispaniola under sail. I made sure, of course, that I should be taken. But I was so distressed for want of water that I scarce knew whether to be glad or sorry at the thought, and long before I had come to a conclusion. Surprise had taken entire possession of my mind, and I could do nothing but stare and wonder. The Hispaniola was under her mainsail and two jibs, and the beautiful white canvas shone in the sun like snow or silver. When I first sighted her, all her sails were drawing. She was lying a course about northwest, and I presumed the men on board were going round the island on their way back to the anchorage. Presently she began to fetch more and more to the westward, so that I thought they had sighted me and were going about in chase. At last, however, she fell right into the wind's eye, was taken dead aback, and stood there a while helpless. With her sails shivering, clumsy fellows, said I, they must still be drunk as owls. And I thought how Captain Smollett would have set them skipping, Meanwhile, the schooner gradually fell off and filled again upon another tack, sailed swiftly for a minute or so, and brought up once more dead in the wind's eye. Again and again was this repeated, to and fro, up and down, north, south, east, and west, the Hispaniola sailed by swoops and dashes, and at each repetition ended as she had begun with idly flapping canvas. It became plain to me that nobody was steering. And if so, where were the men? Either they were dead drunk or had deserted her, I thought. And perhaps if I could get on board, I might return the vessel to her captain. The current was bearing coracle and schooner southward at an equal rate. As for the latter sailing, it was so wild and intermittent, and she hung each time so long in irons that she certainly gained nothing if she did not even lose. If only I dared to sit up and paddle. I made sure that I could overhaul her. The scheme had an air of adventure that inspired me, and the thought of the water breaker beside the four companion doubled my growing courage. Up I got, was welcomed almost instantly by another cloud of spray, but this time stuck to my purpose and set myself, with all my strength and caution, to paddle after the unsteered Hispaniola. 
Once I shipped a sea so heavy that I had to stop and bail, with my heart fluttering like a bird. But gradually I got into the way of the thing and guided my coracle among the waves, with only now and then a blow upon her bows and a dash of foam in my face. I was now gaining rapidly on the schooner. I could see the brass glisten on the tiller as it banged about, and still no soul appeared upon her decks. I could not choose but suppose she was deserted. If not, the men were lying drunk below, where I might batten them down, perhaps, and do what I chose with the ship. For some time she had been doing the worst thing possible for me standing still. She headed nearly due south, yawing, of course, all the time. Each time she fell off, her sails partly filled, and these brought her in a moment right to the wind again. I have said this was the worst thing possible for me, for helpless as she looked in this situation. With the canvas cracking like cannon and the blocks trundling and banging on the deck, she still continued to run away from me, not only with the speed of the current, but by the whole amount of her leeway, which was naturally great. But now, at last, I had my chance. The breeze fell for some seconds, very low, and the current gradually turning her. The Hispaniola revolved slowly round her center, and at last presented me her stern, with the cabin window still gaping open and the lamp over the table still burning on into the day. The mainsail hung drooped like a banner. She was stock still but for the current. For the last little while I had even lost, but now redoubling my efforts. I began once more to overhaul the chase. I was not a hundred yards from her when the wind came again in a clap. She filled on the port tack and was off again, stooping and skimming like a swallow. My first impulse was one of despair, but my second was towards joy. Round she came till she was broadside onto Miran still, till she had covered a half, and then two-thirds, and then three-quarters of the distance that separated us. I could see the waves boiling white under her forefoot. Immensely tall, she looked to me from my low station in the coracle. And then, of a sudden, I began to comprehend. I had scarce time to think, scarce time to act and save myself. I was on the summit of one swell when the schooner came stooping over the next. The bowsprit was over my head. I sprang to my feet and leaped, stamping the coracle underwater. With one hand I caught the jib boom, while my foot was lodged between the stay and the brace. And as I still clung there panting, a dull blow told me that the schooner had charged down upon and struck the coracle and that I was left without retreat on the Hispaniola. XXV I strike the Jolly Roger I had scarce gained a position on the bowsprit when the flying jib flapped and filled upon the other tack with a report like a gun. The schooner trembled to her keel under the reverse, but next moment, the other sails still drawing, the jib flapped back again and hung idle. This had nearly tossed me off into the sea. And now I lost no time, crawled back along the bowsprit, and tumbled head foremost on the deck. I was on the lee side of the forecastle and the mainsail, which was still drawing, concealed from me a certain portion of the afterdeck. Not a soul was to be seen. The planks, which had not been swabbed since the mutiny, bore the print of many feet and an empty bottle. Broken by the neck, tumbled to and fro like a live thing in the scuppers. Suddenly the Hispaniola came right into the wind. The jibs behind me cracked aloud, the rudder slammed too. The whole ship gave a sickening heave and shudder, and at the same moment the main boom swung inboard, the sheet groaning in the blocks, and showed me the lee after deck. There were the two watchmen, 
Sure enough, red cap on his back, as stiff as a hand spike, with his arms stretched out like those of a crucifix and his teeth showing through his open lips. Israel hands propped against the bulwarks, his chin on his chest, his hands lying open before him on the deck, his face as white under its tan as a tallow candle. For a while the ship kept bucking and sidling like a vicious horse, the sails filling, now on one tack, now on another. And the boom swinging to and fro till the mast groaned aloud under the strain. Now and again, too, there would come a cloud of light sprays over the bulwark and a heavy blow of the ship's bows against the swell. So much heavier weather was made of it by this great rigged ship than by my homemade, lopsided coracle, now gone to the bottom of the sea. At every jump of the schooner, Redcap slipped to and fro, but what was ghastly to behold neither his attitude nor his fixed teeth disclosing grin was any way disturbed by this rough usage. At every jump too, Hans appeared still more to sink into himself and settle down upon the deck, his feet sliding ever the farther out, and the whole body canting towards the stern, so that his face became, little by little, hid from me, and at last I could see nothing beyond his ear and the frayed ringlet of one whisker. At the same time, I observed, around both of them, splashes of dark blood upon the planks and began to feel sure that they had killed each other in their drunken wrath. While I was thus looking and wondering in a calm moment, when the ship was still, Israel hands turned partly round, and with a low moan writhed himself back to the position in which I had seen him first. The moan, which told of pain and deadly weakness, and the way in which his jaw hung open went right to my heart. But when I remembered the talk I had overheard from the apple barrel, all pity left me. I walked aft until I reached the mainmast, come aboard. Mr. Hands, I said ironically. He rolled his eyes round heavily, but he was too far gone to express surprise. All he could do was to utter one word, Brandy. It occurred to me there was no time to lose, and dodging the boom as it once more lurched across the deck, I slipped aft and down the companion stairs into the cabin. It was such a scene of confusion as you can hardly fancy. All the law fast places had been broken open in quest of the chart. The floor was thick with mud where ruffians had sat down to drink or consult after wading in the marshes round their camp. The bulkheads, all painted in clear white and beaded round with gilt, bore a pattern of dirty hands. Dozens of empty bottles clinked together in corners to the rolling of the ship. One of the doctor's medical books lay open on the table, half of the leaves gutted out, I suppose, for pipe lights. In the midst of all this the lamp still cast a smoky glow, obscure and brown as umber. I went into the cellar. All the barrels were gone and of the bottles a most surprising number had been drunk out and thrown away. Certainly, since the mutiny began, not a man of them could ever have been sober. Foraging about, I found a bottle with some brandy left, four hands, and for myself I routed out some biscuit, some pickled fruits, a great bunch of raisins, and a piece of cheese. With these I came on deck, put down my own stock behind the rudder head and well out of the coxswain's reach, went forward to the water breaker and had a good deep drink of water, and then, and not till then, gave hands the brandy. He must have drunk a gill before he took the bottle from his mouth. I, said he, by thunder, but I wanted some oh that. I had sat down already in my own corner and begun to eat, much hurt. I asked him. 
He grunted, or rather, I might say, he barked. If that doctor was aboard, he said, I'd be right enough in a couple of turns, but I don't have no manner of luck, you see, and that's what's the matter with me. As for that swab, he's good and dead, he is, he added. Indicating the man with the red cap, he weren't no seaman anyhow. And where might you have come from? Well, said I, I've come aboard to take possession of this ship, Mr. Hands. And you'll please regard me as your captain until further notice. He looked at me sourly enough, but said nothing. Some of the color had come back into his cheeks, though he still looked very sick and still continued to slip out and settle down as the ship banged about. By the by, I continued, I can't have these colors, Mr. Hands, and by your leave. I'll strike M. Um, better none than these. And again dodging the boom, I ran to the color lines, handed down their cursed black flag, and chucked it overboard. God save the king, said I, waving my cap, and there's an end to Captain Silver. He watched me keenly and slyly, his chin all the while on his breast. I reckon, he said at last, I reckon, Captain Hawkins. You'll kind of want to get ashore now. Spose we talks. Why, yes, says I, with all my heart, Mr. Hands. Say on. And I went back to my meal with a good appetite. This man, he began. Nodding feebly at the corpse, O'Brien were his name, a rank Irelander this man, and me got the canvas on her, meaning for to sail her back. Well, he's dead now, he is as dead as Bilge. And who's to sail this ship, I don't see. Without I gives you a hint, you ain't that man, as far as I can tell. Now, look here. You gives me food and drink and an old scarf or ink share to tie my wound up. You do, and I'll tell you how to sail her, and that's about square all round, I take it. I'll tell you one thing, says I. I'm not going back to Captain Kidd's anchorage. I mean to get into North Inlet and beach her quietly there. To be sure you did, he cried. Why? I ain't such an infernal lubber after all. I can see, can't I? I've tried my fling, I have, and I've lost. And it's you has the wind of me. North Inlet? Why, I haven't no CH ice, not I. I'd help you sail her up to execution dock by thunder. So I would. Well, as it seemed to me, there was some sense in this. We struck our bargain on the spot. In three minutes, I had the Hispaniola sailing easily before the wind along the coast of Treasure Island. With good hopes of turning the northern point ere noon and beating down again as far as North Inlet before high water. When we might beach her safely and wait till the subsiding tide permitted us to land. Then I lashed the tiller and went below to my own chest where I got a soft silk handkerchief of my mother's. With this and with my aid, Hans bound up the great bleeding stab he had received in the thigh. And after he had eaten a little and had a swallow or two more of the brandy, he began to pick up visibly, sat straighter up, spoke louder and clearer, and looked in every way another man. The breeze served us admirably. We skimmed before it like a bird, the coast of the island flashing by and the view changing every minute. Soon we were past the highlands and bowling beside low, sandy country, sparsely dotted with dwarf pines. And soon we were beyond that again and had turned the corner of the rocky hill that ends the island on the north. I was greatly elated with my new command and pleased with the bright, sunshiny weather and these different prospects of the coast. I had now plenty of water and good things to eat, 
and my conscience, which had smitten me hard for my desertion, was quieted by the great conquest I had made. I should, I think, have had nothing left me to desire but for the eyes of the coxswain as they followed me derisively about the deck and the odd smile that appeared continually on his face. It was a smile that had in it something both of pain and weakness, a haggard old man's smile. But there was, besides that, a grain of derision, a shadow of treachery. In his expression as he craftily watched and watched and watched me at my work. XXVI Israel hands the wind, serving us to a desire, now hauled into the west. We could run so much the easier from the northeast corner of the island to the mouth of the north inlet. Only, as we had no power to anchor and dared not beach her till the tide had flowed a good deal farther, time hung on our hands. The coxswain told me how to lay the ship to. After a good many trials I succeeded, and we both sat in silence over another meal, Captain said he at length with that same uncomfortable smile, here's my old shipmate, O'Brien. I suppose you was to heave him overboard. I ain't particular as a rule, and I don't take no blame for settling his hash, but I don't reckon him ornamental now, do you? I'm not strong enough, and I don't like the job. And there he lies for me, said I. This here's an unlucky ship, this Hispaniola, Jim, he went on, blinking. There's a power of men been killed in this Hispaniola site. Oh, poor seaman dead and gone since you and me took ship to Bristol. I never seen such dirty luck, not I. There was this here O'Brien, now he's dead, ain't he? Well now, I'm no scholar, and you're a lad as can read and figure, and to put it straight, do you take it as a dead man is dead for good? Or do he come alive again? You can kill the body, Mr. Hands, but not the spirit. You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien, there is in another world, and may be watching us. Ah, uh, says he, well... That's unfortunate appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. Howsomever, spirits don't reckon for much by what I've seen. I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now, you've spoke up free, and I'll take it kind if you'd step down into that there cabin and get me a well, a shiver my timbers. I can't hit the name on T, well, you get me a bottle of wine. Jim, this here brandy's too strong for my head. Now, the coxswain's hesitation seemed to be unnatural, and as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy, I entirely disbelieved it. The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck so much was plain, but with what purpose I could in no way imagine. His eyes never met mine. They kept wandering to and fro. Up and down, now with a look to the sky, now with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brien. All the time he kept smiling and putting his tongue out in the most guilty, embarrassed manner, so that a child could have told that he was bent on some deception. I was prompt with my answer, however, for I saw where my advantage lay, and that with a fellow so densely stupid I could easily conceal my suspicions to the end, some wine. I said, far better. Will you have white or red? Well, I reckon it's about the blessed same to me, shipmate, he replied. So it's strong and plenty of it, what's the odds? All right, I answered. I'll bring you port, Mr. Hands, but I'll have to dig for it. With that, I scuttled down the companion with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes, ran quietly along the sparred gallery, mounted the forecastle ladder, and popped my head out of the fore companion. I knew he would not expect to see me there, yet I took every precaution possible 
and certainly the worst of my suspicions proved too true. He had risen from his position to his hands and knees, and though his leg obviously hurt him pretty sharply when he moved for I could hear him stifle a groan yet it was at a good, rattling rate that he trailed himself across the deck. In half a minute he had reached the port scuppers and picked, out of a coil of rope, a long knife, or rather a short dirk, discolored to the hilt with blood. He looked upon it for a moment, thrusting forth his under jaw, tried the point upon his hand, and then, hastily concealing it in the bosom of his jacket, trundled back again into his old place against the bulwark. This was all that I required to know. Israel could move about, he was now armed, and if he had been at so much trouble to get rid of me, it was plain that I was meant to be the victim. What he would do afterwards whether he would try to crawl right across the island from North Inlet to the camp among the swamps, or whether he would fire Long Tom. Trusting that his own comrades might come first to help him was, of course, more than I could say. Yet I felt sure that I could trust him in one point. Since in that our interests jumped together, and that was in the disposition of the schooner. We both desired to have her stranded safe enough, in a sheltered place, and so that, when the time came, she could be got off again with as little labor and danger as might be, and until that was done I considered that my life would certainly be spared. While I was thus turning the business over in my mind, I had not been idle with my body. I had stolen back to the cabin, slipped once more into my shoes, and laid my hand at random on a bottle of wine, and now, with this for an excuse, I made my reappearance on the deck. Hands lay as I had left him, all fallen together in a bundle and with his eyelids lowered as though he were too weak to bear the light. He looked up, however, at my coming knocked the neck off the bottle like a man who had done the same thing often and took a good swig with his favorite toast of, here's luck. Then he lay quiet for a little and then, pulling out a stick of tobacco, begged me to cut him a quid. Cut me a junk, oh that, says he, for I haven't no knife and hardly strength enough, so be as I had. Ah, uh, Jim, Jim. I reckon I've missed stays. Cut me a quid, as likely be the last. Lad, for I'm for my long home, and no mistake. Well, said I, I'll cut you some tobacco, but if I was you and thought myself so badly, I would go to my prayers like a Christian man. Why, said he, now you tell me why. Why? I cried. You were asking me just now about the dead. You've broken your trust. You've lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet this moment, and you ask me why. For God's mercy, Mr. Hands, that's why. I spoke with a little heat. Thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket and designed, in his ill thoughts, to end me with. He, for his part, took a great draught of the wine and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. For thirty years, he said, I've sailed the seas and seen good and bad, better and worse, fair weather and foul. Provisions running out, knives going, and what not. Well, now I tell you, I never seen good come, oh goodness yet. Him as strikes first is my fancy. Dead men don't bite. Them's my views, amen. So be it. And now you look here, he added, suddenly changing his tone. We've had about enough of this foolery. The tide's made good enough by now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll sail slap in and be done with it. All told, we had scarce two miles to run, 
but the navigation was delicate. The entrance to this northern anchorage was not only narrow and shoal, but lay east and west, so that the schooner must be nicely handled to be got in. I think I was a good, prompt subaltern, and I am very sure that Hans was an excellent pilot. For we went about and about and dodged in, shaving the banks with a certainty and a neatness that were a pleasure to behold. Scarcely had we passed the heads before the land closed around us. The shores of North Inlet were as thickly wooded as those of the southern anchorage, but the space was longer and narrower and more like, what in truth it was, the estuary of a river, right before us at the southern end. We saw the wreck of a ship in the last stages of dilapidation. It had been a great vessel of three masts, but had lain so long exposed to the injuries of the weather that it was hung about with great webs of dripping seaweed. And on the deck of its shore bushes had taken root and now flourished thick with flowers. It was a sad sight, but it showed us that the anchorage was calm. Now, said Hans, look there. There's a pet fit for to beach a ship in. Fine flat sand, never a cat's paw, trees all around of it, and flowers a blowing like a garden on that old ship. And once beached, I inquired, How shall we get her off again? Why, so, he replied, You take a line ashore there on the other side at low water, take a turn about one of them big pines, bring it back. Take a turn around the capstan and lie to for the tide. Come high water, all hands take a pull upon the line, and off she comes as sweet as natur. And now, boy, you stand by. We're near the bit now, and she's too much way on her. Starboard a little so steady, starboard larboard a little steady steady. So he issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed, till, all of a sudden, he cried. Now, my hearty luff. And I put the helm hard up, and the Hispaniola swung round rapidly and ran stem on for the low, wooded shore. The excitement of these last maneuvers had somewhat interfered with the watch I had kept hitherto, sharply enough, upon the coxswain. Even then I was still so much interested, waiting for the ship to touch, that I had quite forgot the peril that hung over my head and stood craning over the starboard bulwarks and watching the ripples spreading wide before the bows. I might have fallen without a struggle for my life had not a sudden disquietude seized upon me and made me turn my head. Perhaps I had heard a creak or seen his shadow moving with the tail of my eye. Perhaps it was an instinct like a cat's, but, sure enough, when I looked round, there was hands, already halfway towards me, with the dirk in his right hand. We must both have cried out aloud when our eyes met, but while mine was the shrill cry of terror, his was a roar of fury like a charging bully's. At the same instant, he threw himself forward and I leapt sideways towards the bows. As I did so, I let go of the tiller, which sprang sharp to leeward, and I think this saved my life, for it struck hands across the chest and stopped him, for the moment, dead. Before he could recover, I was safe out of the corner where he had me trapped, with all the deck to dodge about. Just forward of the mainmast I stopped, drew a pistol from my pocket, took a cool aim. Though he had already turned and was once more coming directly after me and drew the trigger, the hammer fell, but there followed neither flash nor sound. The priming was useless with seawater. I cursed myself for my neglect. Why had not I, long before, reprimed and reloaded my only weapons? Then I should not have been as now, a mere fleeing sheep before this butcher. Wounded as he was, 
It was wonderful how fast he could move, his grizzled hair tumbling over his face, and his face itself as red as a red ensign with his haste and fury. I had no time to try my other pistol, nor indeed much inclination, for I was sure it would be useless. One thing I saw plainly. I must not simply retreat before him, or he would speedily hold me boxed into the bows, as a moment since he had so nearly boxed me in the stern. Once so caught, and nine or ten inches of the blood-stained dirk would be my last experience on this side of eternity. I placed my palms against the mainmast, which was of a goodish bigness, and waited. Every nerve upon the stretch. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused, and a moment or two passed in feints on his part and corresponding movements upon mine. It was such a game as I had often played at home about the rocks of Black Hill Cove, but never before, you may be sure, with such a wildly beating heart as now. Still, as I say, it was a boy's game. And I thought I could hold my own at it against an elderly seaman with a wounded thigh. Indeed, my courage had begun to rise so high that I allowed myself a few darting thoughts on what would be the end of the affair, and, while I saw certainly that I could spin it out for long, I saw no hope of any ultimate escape. Well, while things stood thus, suddenly the Hispaniola struck, staggered, ground for an instant in the sand, and then, swift as a blow. Canned over to the port side till the deck stood at an angle of 45 degrees and about a puncheon of water splashed into the scupper holes and lay in a pool between the deck and bulwark. We were both of us capsized in a second and both of us rolled almost together into the scuppers, the dead red cap with his arms still spread out tumbling stiffly after us. So near were we, indeed, that my head came against the coxswain's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. Blow and all, I was the first afoot again, for hands had got involved with the dead body. The sudden canning of the ship had made the deck no place for running on. I had to find some new way of escape, and that upon the instant for my foe was almost touching me. Quick as thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, rattled up hand over hand, and did not draw a breath till I was seated on the cross trees. I had been saved by being prompt. The dirk had struck not half a foot below me as I pursued my upward flight, and there stood Israel hands with his mouth open and his face upturned to mine, a perfect statue of surprise and disappointment. Now that I had a moment to myself, I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol, and then having one ready for service. And to make assurance doubly sure, I proceeded to draw the load of the other and recharge it afresh from the beginning. My new employment struck hands all of a heap. He began to see the dice going against him, and after an obvious hesitation, he also hauled himself heavily into the shrouds and with the dirk in his teeth, began slowly and painfully to mount. It cost him no end of time and groans to haul his wounded leg behind him, and I had quietly finished my arrangements before he was much more than a third of the way up. Then, with a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. One more step, Mr. Hands, said I, and I'll blow your brains out. Dead men don't bite, you know, I added with a chuckle. He stopped instantly. I could see by the working of his face that he was trying to think. And the process was so slow and laborious that, in my newfound security, I laughed aloud. At last, with a swallow or two, he spoke, his face still wearing the same expression of extreme perplexity. 
In order to speak, he had to take the dagger from his mouth, but in all else he remained unmoved. Jim, says he, I reckon we're fouled, you and me, and we'll have to sign articles. I'd have had you but for that there lurch, but I don't have no luck, not I, and I reckon I'll have to strike, which comes hard, you see. For a master mariner to a ship's yunker like you, Jim, I was drinking in his words and smiling away, as conceited as a cock upon a wall, when, all in a breath, back went his right hand over his shoulder. Something sang like an arrow through the air. I felt a blow and then a sharp pang, and there I was pinned by the shoulder to the mast. In the horrid pain and surprise of the moment I scarce can say it was by my own volition, and I am sure it was without a conscious aim both my pistols went off, and both escaped out of my hands. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry, the coxswain loosed his grasp upon the shrouds and plunged head first into the water. XXVI, pieces of eight. Owing to the cant of the vessel, the masts hung far out over the water, and from my perch on the cross trees I had nothing below me but the surface of the bay. Hands, who was not so far up, was in consequence nearer to the ship and fell between me and the bulwarks. He rose once to the surface in a lather of foam and blood, and then sank again for good. As the water settled, I could see him lying huddled together on the clean, bright sand in the shadow of the vessel's sides. A fish or two whipped past his body, sometimes by the quivering of the water. He appeared to move a little, as if he were trying to rise. But he was dead enough for all that, being both shot and drowned and was food for fish in the very place where he had designed my slaughter. I was no sooner certain of this than I began to feel sick, faint, and terrified. The hot blood was running over my back and chest. The dirk, where it had pinned my shoulder to the mast, seemed to burn like a hot iron. Yet it was not so much these real sufferings that distressed me, for these, it seemed to me, I could bear without a murmur. It was the horror I had upon my mind of falling from the cross trees into that still green water beside the body of the coxswain. I clung with both hands till my nails ached, and I shut my eyes as if to cover up the peril. Gradually my mind came back again, my pulses quieted down to a more natural time, and I was once more in possession of myself. It was my first thought to pluck forth the dirk, but either it stuck too hard or my nerve failed me, and I desisted with a violent shudder. Oddly enough, that very shudder did the business. The knife, in fact, had come the nearest in the world to missing me altogether. It held me by a mere pinch of skin, and this the shudder tore away. The blood ran down the faster, to be sure. But I was my own master again, and only tacked to the mast by my coat and shirt. These last I broke through with a sudden jerk, and then regained the deck by the starboard shrouds. For nothing in the world would I have again ventured, shaken as I was, upon the overhanging port shrouds from which Israel had so lately fallen. I went below and did what I could for my wound. It pained me a good deal and still bled freely, but it was neither deep nor dangerous, nor did it greatly gall me when I used my arm. Then I looked around me, and as the ship was now, in a sense, my own, I began to think of clearing it from its last passenger, the dead man, O'Brien. He had pitched, as I have said, against the bulwarks, where he lay like some horrible, ungainly sort of puppet, life-size, indeed, but how different from life's color or life's comeliness. In that position I could easily have my way with him, 
And as the habit of tragical adventures had worn off almost all my terror for the dead, I took him by the waist as if he had been a sack of bran and with one good heave, tumbled him overboard. He went in with a sounding plunge. The red cap came off and remained floating on the surface, and as soon as the splash subsided, I could see him and Israel lying side by side, both wavering with the tremulous movement of the water. O'Brien, though still quite a young man, was very bald. There he lay, with that bald head across the knees of the man who had killed him and the quick fishes steering to and fro over both. I was now alone upon the ship. The tide had just turned. The sun was within so few degrees of setting that already the shadow of the pines upon the western shore began to reach right across the anchorage and fall in patterns on the deck. The evening breeze had sprung up, and though it was well warded off by the hill with the two peaks upon the east, the cordage had begun to sing a little softly to itself and the idle sails to rattle to and fro. I began to see a danger to the ship. The jibs I speedily doused and brought tumbling to the deck, but the mainsail was a harder matter. Of course, when the schooner canted over, the boom had swung outboard, and the cap of it and a foot or two of sail hung even under water. I thought this made it still more dangerous, yet the strain was so heavy that I half feared to meddle. At last I got my knife and cut the halyards. The peak dropped instantly. A great belly of loose canvas floated broad upon the water, and since, pull as I liked, I could not budge the downhaul. That was the extent of what I could accomplish. For the rest, the Hispaniola must trust to luck, like myself. By this time, the whole anchorage had fallen into shadow the last rays. I remember falling through a glade of the wood and shining bright as jewels on the flowery mantle of the wreck. It began to be chill. The tide was rapidly fleeting seaward, the schooner settling more and more on her beam ends. I scrambled forward and looked over. It seemed shallow enough and holding the cut hawser in both hands for a last security. I let myself drop softly overboard. The water scarcely reached my waist. The sand was firm and covered with ripple marks, and I waded ashore in great spirits, leaving the Hispaniola on her side, with her mainsail trailing wide upon the surface of the bay. About the same time, the sun went fairly down and the breeze whistled low in the dusk among the tossing pines. At least, and at last, I was off the sea, nor had I returned thence empty-handed. There lay the schooner, clear at last from buccaneers and ready for our own men to board and get to sea again. I had nothing nearer my fancy than to get home to the stockade and boast of my achievements. Possibly, I might be blamed a bit for my truantry. But the recapture of the Hispaniola was a clenching answer, and I hoped that even Captain Smollett would confess I had not lost my time. So thinking, and in famous spirits, I began to set my face homeward for the blockhouse and my companions. I remembered that the most easterly of the rivers which drain into Captain Kidd's anchorage ran from the two-peaked hill upon my left, and I bent my course in that direction that I might pass the stream while it was small. The wood was pretty open, and keeping along the lower spurs, I had soon turned the corner of that hill, and not long after waded to the mid-calf across the watercourse. This brought me near to where I had encountered Ben Gunn, the maroon, and I walked more circumspectly, keeping an eye on every side. The dusk had come nigh hand completely, and as I opened out the cleft between the two peaks, I became aware of a wavering glow against the sky, 
where, as I judged, the man of the island was cooking his supper before a roaring fire. And yet I wondered, in my heart, that he should show himself so careless. For if I could see this radiance, might it not reach the eyes of Silver himself where he camped upon the shore among the marshes? Gradually the night fell blacker. It was all I could do to guide myself even roughly towards my destination. The double hill behind me and the spyglass on my right hand loomed faint and fainter. The stars were few and pale, and in the low ground where I wandered I kept tripping among bushes and rolling into sandy pits. Suddenly a kind of brightness fell about me. I looked up. A pale glimmer of moonbeams had alighted on the summit of the spyglass, and soon after I saw something broad and silvery moving low down behind the trees, and knew the moon had risen. With this to help me, I passed rapidly over what remained to me of my journey, and sometimes walking, sometimes running, impatiently drew near to the stockade. Yet. As I began to thread the grove that lies before it, I was not so thoughtless, but that I slacked my pace and went a trifle warily. It would have been a poor end of my adventures to get shot down by my own party in mistake. The moon was climbing higher and higher. Its light began to fall here and there in masses through the more open districts of the wood and right in front of me a glow of a different color appeared among the trees. It was red and hot, and now and again it was a little darkened as it were, the embers of a bonfire smoldering. For the life of me I could not think what it might be. At last I came right down upon the borders of the clearing. The western end was already steeped in moonshine, the rest and the block house itself still lay in a black shadow checkered with long silvery streaks of light. On the other side of the house an immense fire had burned itself into clear embers and shed a steady. Red reverberation contrasted strongly with the mellow paleness of the moon. There was not a soul stirring nor a sound beside the noises of the breeze. I stopped. With much wonder in my heart, and perhaps a little terror also. It had not been our way to build great fires. We were, indeed, by the captain's orders, somewhat niggardly of firewood. And I began to fear that something had gone wrong while I was absent. I stole round by the eastern end, keeping close in shadow and at a convenient place where the darkness was thickest crossed the palisade. To make assurance sure, I got upon my hands and knees and crawled, without a sound, towards the corner of the house. As I drew nearer, my heart was suddenly and greatly lightened. It is not a pleasant noise in itself, and I have often complained of it at other times. But just then it was like music to hear my friends snoring together so loud and peaceful in their sleep. The sea cry of the watch, that beautiful all's well, never fell more reassuringly on my ear. In the meantime, there was no doubt of one thing. They kept an infamous bad watch. If it had been Silver and his lads that were now creeping in on them, not a soul would have seen daybreak. That was what it was, thought I, to have the captain wounded. And again I blamed myself sharply for leaving them in that danger with so few to mount guard. By this time I had got to the door and stood up. All was dark within, so that I could distinguish nothing by the eye. As for sounds, there was the steady drone of the snorers and a small occasional noise. A flickering or pecking that I could in no way account for. With my arms before me I walked steadily in. I should lie down in my own place, I thought with a silent chuckle, and enjoy their faces when they found me in the morning. My foot struck something yielding it was a sleeper's leg, 
and he turned and groaned, but without awaking. And then, all of a sudden, a shrill voice broke forth out of the darkness. Pieces of eight. 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 And so forth, without pause or change. Like the clacking of a tiny mill. Silver's green parrot, Captain Flint. It was she whom I had heard pecking at a piece of bark. It was she, keeping better watch than any human being, who thus announced my arrival with her wearisome refrain. I had no time left me to recover. At the sharp, clipping tone of the parrot, the sleepers awoke and sprang up. And with a mighty oath, the voice of Silver cried, Who goes? I turned to run, struck violently against one person, recoiled, and ran full into the arms of a second, who for his part closed upon and held me tight. Bring a torch, Dick, said Silver when my capture was thus assured. And one of the men left the log house and presently returned with a lighted brand. Part 6 Captain Silver XXVI and the enemies camp the red glare of the torch. Lighting up the interior of the blockhouse showed me the worst of my apprehensions realized. The pirates were in possession of the house and stores. There was the cask of cognac. There were the pork and bread, as before, and what tenfold increased my horror, not a sign of any prisoner. I could only judge that all had perished, and my heart smote me sorely that I had not been there to perish with them. There were six of the buccaneers, all told. Not another man was left alive. Five of them were on their feet. Flushed and swollen, suddenly called out of the first sleep of drunkenness. The sixth had only risen upon his elbow. He was deadly pale and the blood-stained bandage round his head told that he had recently been wounded and still more recently dressed. I remembered the man who had been shot and had run back among the woods in the great attack and doubted not that this was he. The parrot sat, preening her plumage on Long John's shoulder. He himself, I thought, looked somewhat paler and more stern than I was used to. He still wore the fine broadcloth suit in which he had fulfilled his mission. But it was bitterly the worse for wear, daubed with clay and torn with the sharp briars of the wood. So, said he, here's Jim Hawkins, shiver my timbers. Dropped in like, eh? Well, come. I take that friendly. And thereupon he sat down across the brandy cask and began to fill a pipe, Give me a loan of the link, Dick, said he, and then, when he had a good light, that'll do. Lad, he added, stick the glim in the wood heap, and you, gentlemen, bring yourselves to. You needn't stand up for Mr. Hawkins. He'll excuse you. You may lay to that. And so, Jim, stopping the tobacco, here you were and quite a pleasant surprise for poor old John. I see you were smart when first I set my eyes on you, but this here gets away from me clean, it do. To all this, as may be well supposed, I made no answer. They had set me with my back against the wall, and I stood there, looking silver in the face, pluckily enough, hope to all outward appearance, but with black despair in my heart. Silver took a whiff or two of his pipe with great composure and then ran on again. Now, you see, Jim, so be as you are here, says he. I'll give you a piece of my mind. I've always liked you, I have, for a lot of spirit and the picture of my own self when I was young and handsome. I always wanted you to jine and take your share. And die a gentleman, and now my cock, you've got to. 
Captain Smollett's a fine seaman, as I'll own up to any day, but stiff on discipline. Duty is duty, says he, and right he is. Just you keep clear of the captain. The doctor himself is gone dead again, you ungrateful scamp, was what he said, and the short and the long of the whole story is about here. You can't go back to your own lot, for they won't have you, and without you start a third ship's company all by yourself, which might be lonely, you'll have to jine with Captain Silver. So far so good. My friends, then, were still alive, and though I partly believed the truth of Silver's statement, that the cabin party were incensed at me for my desertion, I was more relieved than distressed by what I heard. I don't say nothing as to your being in our hands, continued Silver, though there you are, and you may lay to it. I'm all for argument. I never seen good come out o oh, threatening. If you like the service, well, you'll jine, and if you don't, Jim, why, you're free to answer no free and welcome, shipmate. And if fairer can be said by mortal seamen, shiver my sides. Am I to answer, then? I asked with a very tremulous voice. Through all this sneering talk, I was made to feel the threat of death that overhung me, and my cheeks burned and my heart beat painfully in my breast. Lad, said Silver, no one's a-pressing of you. Take your bearings. None of us won't hurry you, mate. Time goes so pleasant in your company, you see. Well, says I, growing a bit bolder, if I'm to choose, I declare I have a right to know what's what and why you're here. And where my friends are. What's what? repeated one of the buccaneers in a deep growl. Ah, uh, he'd be a lucky one as knowed that. You'll perhaps fatten down your hatches till you're spoke to, my friend," cried Silver truculently to the speaker. And then, in his first gracious tones, he replied to me, Yesterday morning, Mr. Hawkins, said he, in the dog watch. Down came Dr. Livesey with a flag of truce. Says he, Captain Silver, you're sold out. Ship's gone. Well, maybe we'd been taking a glass and a song to help it round. I won't say no. Leastways. None of us had looked out. We looked out, and by thunder, the old ship was gone. I never seen a pack o oh, fools look fishier, and you may lay to that if I tells you that looked the fishiest. Well, says the doctor, let's bargain. We bargained. Him and I, and here we are, stores, brandy, block house, the firewood you was thoughtful enough to cut, and in a manner of speaking, the whole blessed boat from cross trees to Kelson. As for them, they've tramped. I don't know where's they are. He drew again quietly at his pipe. And lest you should take it into that head of yours, he went on that you was included in the treaty. Here's the last word that was said. How many are you, says I, to leave? Four, says he, four. And one of us wounded. As for that boy, I don't know where he is. Confound him, says he, nor I don't much care. We're about sick of him. These was his words. Is that all? I asked, well, it's all that you're to hear, my son, returned Silver, and now I am to choose. And now you are to choose, and you may lay to that, said Silver. Well, said I, I am not such a fool, but I know pretty well what I have to look for. Let the worst come to the worst, it's little I care. I've seen too many die since I fell in with you. But there's a thing or two I have to tell you. I said, and by this time I was quite excited, and the first is this. Here you are, in a bad way ship lost, treasure lost, men lost. Your whole business gone to wreck, 
And if you want to know who did it, it was I. I was in the apple barrel the night we sighted land, and I heard you, John, and you, Dick Johnson and Hans, who is now at the bottom of the sea and told every word you said before the hour was out. And as for the schooner, it was I who cut her cable, and it was I that killed the men you had aboard of her, and it was I who brought her where you'll never see her more, not one of you. The laughs on my side, I've had the top of this business from the first, I no more fear you than I fear a fly. Kill me, if you please, or spare me. But one thing I'll say, and no more, if you spare me, bygones are bygones, and when you fellows are in court for piracy, I'll save you all I can. It is for you to choose. Kill another and do yourselves no good, or spare me and keep a witness to save you from the gallows. I stopped, for I tell you, I was out of breath, and to my wonder, not a man of them moved, but all sat staring at me like as many sheep. And while they were still staring, I broke out again, and now, Mr. Silver, I said, I believe you're the best man here, and if things go to the worst, I'll take it kind of you to let the doctor know the way I took it. I'll bear it in mind said Silver with an accent so curious that I could not, for the life of me. Decide whether he were laughing at my request or had been favorably affected by my courage, I'll put one to that. Cried the old mahogany-faced Seaman Morgan by name whom I had seen in Long John's public house upon the quays of Bristol, it was him that knowed Black Dog. Well, and see here added the sea cook, I'll put another again to that, by thunder, for it was this same boy that faked the chart from Billy Bones. First and last, we've split upon Jim Hawkins. Then here goes, said Morgan with an oath, and he sprang up, drawing his knife as if he had been twenty, a vast, there, cried Silver, who are you, Tom Morgan? Maybe you thought you was captain here, perhaps. By the powers, but I'll teach you better. Cross me, and you'll go where many a good man's gone before you. First and last, these thirty year backs them to the yard arm, shiver my timbers, and some by the board, and all to feed the fishes. There's never a man looked me between the eyes and seen a good day a terwards. Tom Morgan, you may lay to that. Morgan paused, but a hoarse murmur rose from the others. Tom's right, said one. I stood hazing long enough from one, added another. I'll be hanged if I'll be hazed by you, John Silver. Did any of you gentlemen want to have it out with me? roared Silver, bending far forward from his position on the keg with his pipe still glowing in his right hand. Put a name on what you're at. You ain't dumb, I reckon. Him that wants shall get it. Have I lived this many years, and a son of a rum punch and cock has had athwart my haws at the latter end of it? You know the way. You're all gentlemen owe fortune, by your account. Well, I'm ready. Take a cutlass, him that dares, and I'll see the color of his inside, crutch and all, before that pipe's empty. Not a man stirred, not a man answered. That's your sort, is it? He added, returning his pipe to his mouth. Well, you're a gay lot to look at. Anyway, not much worth to fight, you ain't. Pure APS, you can understand King George's English. I'm captain here by election. I'm captain here because I'm the best man by a long sea mile. You won't fight as gentlemen, O oh, fortune should. Then, by thunder, you'll obey and you may lay to it. I like that boy now. I never seen a better boy than that. He's more a man than any pair of rats of you in this here house. And what I say is this. 
Let me see him that'll lay a hand on him, that's what I say, and you may lay to it. There was a long pause after this. I stood straight up against the wall, my heart still going like a sledgehammer. But with a ray of hope now shining in my bosom, Silver leant back against the wall, his arms crossed, his pipe in the corner of his mouth, as calm as though he had been in church. Yet his eye kept wandering furtively, and he kept the tail of it on his unruly followers. They, on their part, drew gradually together towards the far end of the blockhouse, and the low hiss of their whispering sounded in my ear continuously, like a stream. One after another, they would look up, and the red light of the torch would fall for a second on their nervous faces, but it was not towards me, it was towards Silver that they turned their eyes. You seem to have a lot to say, remarked Silver, spitting far into the air. Pipe up and let me hear it or lay to. Ax your pardon, sir, returned one of the men. You're pretty free with some of the rules. Maybe you'll kindly keep an eye upon the rest. This crew's dissatisfied. This crew don't valley bullying a marlin spike. This crew has its rights like other crews. I'll make so free as that. And by your own rules, I take it we can talk together. I ax your pardon, sir, acknowledging you for to be captain at this present, but I claim my right and steps outside for a council. And with an elaborate sea salute, this fellow, a long, ill-looking, yellow-eyed man of five and thirty, stepped coolly towards the door and disappeared out of the house. One after another, the rest followed his example, each making a salute as he passed, each adding some apology. According to rules, said one, Foxel Council, said Morgan. And so with one remark or another, all marched out and left Silver and me alone with the torch. The sea cook instantly removed his pipe. Now, look you here, Jim Hawkins. He said in a steady whisper that was no more than audible, you're within half a plank of death, and what's a long sight worse of torture? They're going to throw me off. But, you mark, I stand by you through thick and thin. I didn't mean to. No, not till you spoke up. I was about desperate to lose that much blunt and be hanged into the bargain. But I see you was the right sort. I says to myself, you stand by Hawkins, John, and Hawkins will stand by you. You're his last card, and by the living thunder, John, he's yours. Back to back, says I, you save your witness, and he'll save your neck. I began dimly to understand. You mean all's lost? I asked, I, by gum, I do, he answered. Ship gone, neck gone, that's the size of it. Once I looked into that bay, Jim Hawkins, and see no schooner well, I'm tough, but I gave out. As for that lot and their counsel, mark me, they're outright fools and cowards. I'll save your life if so be as I can from them. But see here, Jim tit for tat you save Long John from swinging. I was bewildered. It seemed a thing so hopeless he was asking he, the old buccaneer, the ringleader throughout, what I can do, that I'll do. I said, it's a bargain, cried Long John, you speak up plucky, and by thunder I've a chance. He hobbled to the torch, where it stood propped among the firewood, and took a fresh light to his pipe. Understand me, Jim, he said, returning, I've a head on my shoulders, I have. I'm on Squire's side now. I know you've got that ship safe somewheres. How you done it, I don't know, but safe it is. I guess Hans and O'Brien turn soft. I never much believed in neither of them. Now you mark me. 
I ask no questions, nor I won't let others. I know when a game's up, I do. And I know a lad that's staunch. Ah, you that's young you and me might have done a power of good together. He drew some cognac from the cask into a tin cannikin. Will you taste, messmate? He asked. And when I had refused, well, I'll take a dram myself. Jim, said he, I need a cocker, for there's trouble on hand. And talking o oh, trouble, why did that doctor give me the chart, Jim? My face expressed a wonder so unaffected that he saw the needlessness of further questions. Ah, uh, well, he did, though, said he, and there's something under that, no doubt something, surely. Under that, Jim bad or good. And he took another swallow of the brandy, shaking his great fair head like a man who looks forward to the worst. Zix the Black spot again the Council of Buccaneers had lasted some time when one of them re-entered the house and with a repetition of the same salute, which had in my eyes an ironical air, begged for a moment's loan of the torch. Silver briefly agreed, and this emissary retired again, leaving us together in the dark. There's a breeze coming, Jim, said Silver, who had by this time adopted quite a friendly and familiar tone. I turned to the loophole nearest me and looked out. The embers of the great fire had so far burned themselves out and now glowed so low and duskily that I understood why these conspirators desired a torch. About halfway down the slope to the stockade, they were collected in a group. One held the light, another was on his knees in their midst. And I saw the blade of an open knife shine in his hand with varying colors in the moon and torchlight. The rest were all somewhat stooping. As though watching the maneuvers of this last, I could just make out that he had a book as well as a knife in his hand, and was still wondering how anything so incongruous had come in their possession when the kneeling figure rose once more to his feet and the whole party began to move together towards the house. Here they come, said I, and I returned to my former position, for it seemed beneath my dignity that they should find me watching them. Well, let M come, lad let M come, said Silver cheerily. I've still a shot in my locker. The door opened, and the five men, standing huddled together just inside, pushed one of their number forward. In any other circumstances, it would have been comical to see his slow advance, hesitating as he set down each foot, but holding his closed right hand in front of him. Step up, lad, cried Silver. I won't eat you. Hand it over, lubber. I know the rules, I do. I won't hurt a deputation. Thus encouraged, the buccaneer stepped forth more briskly. And having passed something to silver from hand to hand, slipped yet more smartly back again to his companions. The sea cook looked at what had been given him, the black spot. I thought so. He observed. Where might you have got the paper? Why, hello. Look here. Now, this ain't lucky. You've gone and cut this out of a Bible. What fools cut a Bible? Ah, uh, there, said Morgan. There. What did I say? No good'll come o' oh, that, I said. Well, you've about fixed it now. Among you, continued Silver. You'll all swing now, I reckon. What soft-headed lubber had a Bible? It was Dick, said one. Dick, was it? Then Dick can get to prayers, said Silver. He's seen his slice of luck, has Dick, and you may lay to that. But hear the long man with the yellow eye struck in, belay that talk, John Silver, he said. This crew has tipped you the black spot in full council, as in duty bound. Just you turn it over, as in duty bound, and see what's wrote there. 
then you can talk. Thank you, George. Replied the sea cook, you always was brisk for business and has the rules by heart, George, as I'm pleased to see. Well, what is it anyway? Ah, depose that's it, is it? Very pretty wrote, to be sure. Like print, I swear. Your hand oh right, George? Why, you is getting quite a Leoden man in this here crew. You'll be captain next, I shouldn't wonder. Just oblige me with that torch again, will you? This pipe don't draw. Come, now, said George, you don't fool this crew no more. You're a funny man, by your account, but you're over now, and you'll maybe step down off that barrel and help vote. I thought you said you knowed the rules, returned Silver contemptuously, leastways. If you don't, I do, and I wait here and I'm still your captain. Mind till you outs with your grievances and I reply. In the meantime, your black spot ain't worth a biscuit. After that, we'll see. Oh, replied George, you don't be under no kind of apprehension. We're all square, we are. First, you've made a hash of this cruise you'll be a bold man to say no to that. Second, you let the enemy out of this here trap for nothing. Why did they want out? I dunno. But it's pretty plain they wanted it. Third, you wouldn't let us go at them upon the march. Oh, we see through you, John Silver. You want to play booty. That's what's wrong with you. And then, fourth, there's this here boy. Is that all? Asked Silver quietly. Enough, too, retorted George. We'll all swing and sun dry for your bungling. Well, now, look here, I'll answer these four PINTs. One after another, I'll answer, um. I made a hash o oh, this cruise, did I? Well, now, you all know what I wanted. And you all know if that had been done that we'd a been aboard the Hispaniola this night as ever was every man of us alive and fit and full of good plum duff and the treasure in the hold of her by thunder well who crossed me who forced my hand as was the lawful captain who tipped me the black spot the day we landed and began this dance ah uh, it's a fine dance I'm with you there and looks mighty like a hornpipe in a rope's end at execution dock by London town, it does. But who done it? Why, it was Anderson and Hans and you. George Mary. And you're the last above board of that same meddling crew. And you have the Davy Jones's insolence to up and stand for captain over me you. That sink the lot of us. By the powers. But this tops the stiffest yarn to nothing. Silver paused, and I could see by the faces of George and his late comrades that these words had not been said in vain. That's for number one. Cried the accused, wiping the sweat from his brow, for he had been talking with a vehemence that shook the house. Why, I give you my word, I'm sick to speak to you. You've neither sense nor memory, and I leave it to fancy where your mother's was that let you come to see. See, gentlemen, oh, fortune. I reckon tailors is your trade. Go on, John, said Morgan. Speak up to the others. Ah, uh, the others, returned John. They're a nice lot, ain't they? You say this cruise is bungled. Ah, uh, by gum. If you could understand how bad it's bungled, you would see. We're that near the gibbet that my neck stiff with thinking on it. You've seen em, um, maybe, hanged in chains, birds about, em, um, seamen panting em um, out as they go down with the tide. Who's that? Says one. That. Why, that's John Silver. I knowed him well, says another. And you can hear the chain's age angle as you go about and reach for the other buoy. Now, that's about where we are. Every mother son of us, thanks to him 
and Hans and Anderson and other ruination fools of you. And if you want to know about number four and that boy, why, shiver my timbers. Isn't he a hostage? Are we going to waste a hostage? No, not us. He might be our last chance, and I shouldn't wonder. Kill that boy? Not me, mates. And number three? Uh, well... There's a deal to say to number three. Maybe you don't count it nothing to have a real college doctor to see you every day you, John, with your head broke or you, George Mary. That had the egg you shakes upon you not six hours agone, and has your eyes the color of lemon peel to the same moment on the clock? And maybe, perhaps, you didn't know there was a consort coming either? But there is, and not so long till then, and we'll see who'll be glad to have a hostage when it comes to that. And as for number two, and why I made a bargain well, you came crawling on your knees to me to make it on your knees you came. You was that downhearted and you'd have starved too if I had, but that's a trifle. You look there, that's why. And he cast down upon the floor a paper that I instantly recognized none other than the chart on yellow paper with the three red crosses that I had found in the oilcloth at the bottom of the captain's chest. Why the doctor had given it to him was more than I could fancy. But if it were inexplicable to me, the appearance of the chart was incredible to the surviving mutineers. They leaped upon it like cats upon a mouse. It went from hand to hand, one tearing it from another. And by the oaths and the cries and the childish laughter with which they accompanied their examination, you would have thought not only they were fingering the very gold, but were at sea with it besides in safety. Yes, said one, that's Flint. Sure enough. J, F, and a score below, with a clove hitch to it, so he done ever. Mighty pretty, said George. But how are we to get away with it, and us no ship? Silver suddenly sprang up, and supporting himself with a hand against the wall. Now I give you warning, George, he cried. One more word of your sauce, and I'll call you down and fight you. How? Why, how do I know? You had ought to tell me that you and the rest that lost me my schooner with your interference burn you. But not you, you can't. You hain't got the invention of a cockroach. But civil you can speak and shall, George Mary, you may lay to that. That's fair enow, said the old man Morgan. Fair. I reckon so, said the sea cook. You lost the ship. I found the treasure. Who's the better man at that? And now I resign by thunder. Elect whom you please to be your captain now. I'm done with it. Silver, they cried. Barbecue forever. Barbecue for captain. So that's the tune, is it? Cried the cook. George, I reckon you'll have to wait another turn, friend and lucky for you as I'm not a revengeful man. But that was never my way. And now, shipmates, this black spot? Tain't much good now, is it? Dick's crossed his luck and spoiled his Bible, and that's about all. It'll do to kiss the book on still. Won't it? growled Dick, who was evidently uneasy at the curse he had brought upon himself. A Bible with a bit cut out, returned silver derisively, not it. It don't buy no more in a ballad book. Don't it, though? cried Dick with a sort of joy. Well, I reckon that's worth having too. Here, Jim here's a curiosity for you, said silver, and he tossed me the paper. It was around about the size of a crown piece. One side was blank, for it had been the last leaf, the other contained a verse or two of revelation these words among the rest, which struck sharply home upon my mind, without our dogs and murderers. The printed side had been blackened with wood ash, 
which already began to come off and soil my fingers. On the blank side had been written with this same material the one word deposed. I have that curiosity beside me at this moment, but not a trace of writing now remains beyond a single scratch, such as a man might make with his thumbnail. That was the end of the night's business. Soon after, with a drink all round, we lay down to sleep, and the outside of Silver's vengeance was to put George Mary up for sentinel and threaten him with death if he should prove unfaithful. It was long ere I could close an eye, and heaven knows I had matter enough for thought in the man whom I had slain that afternoon, in my own most perilous position, and above all, in the remarkable game that I saw Silver now engaged upon keeping the mutineers together with one hand and grasping with the other after every means, possible and impossible, to make his peace and save his miserable life. He himself slept peacefully and snored aloud, yet my heart was sore for him, wicked as he was. To think on the dark perils that environed and the shameful gibbet that awaited him. Triple X on parole I was wakened indeed. We were all wakened. For I could see even the sentinel shake himself together from where he had fallen against the doorpost by a clear, hearty voice hailing us from the margin of the wood. Block house, ahoy! It cried, here's the doctor. And the doctor it was, although I was glad to hear the sound, yet my gladness was not without admixture. I remembered with confusion my insubordinate and stealthy conduct, and when I saw where it had brought me among what companions and surrounded by what dangers I felt ashamed to look him in the face, he must have risen in the dark. For the day had hardly come, and when I ran to a loophole and looked out, I saw him standing, like silver once before, up to the mid-leg in creeping vapor. You, doctor. Top, oh, the morning to you. Sir, cried silver, broad awake and beaming with good nature in a moment, bright and early, to be sure, and it's the early bird, as the saying goes, that gets the rations. George, shake up your timbers, son, and help Dr. Livesey over the ship's side. All a doin' well, your patience was all well and merry. So he pattered on. Standing on the hilltop with his crutch under his elbow and one hand upon the side of the log house quite the old John in voice, manner, and expression, we've quite a surprise for you too. Sir, he continued, we've a little stranger here, he, he, a Noah boarder and lodger, sir, and looking fit and taut as a fiddle, slept like a supercargo, he did, right alongside of John stem to stem we was all night. Dr. Livesey was by this time across the stockade and pretty near the cook, and I could hear the alteration in his voice as he said, not Jim. The very same Jim as ever was, says Silver. The doctor stopped outright, although he did not speak, and it was some seconds before he seemed able to move on. Well, well, he said at last. Duty first and pleasure afterwards, as you might have said yourself, Silver. Let us overhaul these patients of yours. A moment afterwards he had entered the block house, and with one grim nod to me proceeded with his work among the sick. He seemed under no apprehension, though he must have known that his life, among these treacherous demons, depended on a hair. And he rattled on to his patients as if he were paying an ordinary professional visit in a quiet English family. His manner, I suppose, reacted on the men, for they behaved to him as if nothing had occurred, as if he were still ship's doctor, and they still faithful hands before the mast. You're doing well, my friend. 
He said to the fellow with the bandaged head, and if ever any person had a close shave, it was you. Your head must be as hard as iron. Well, George, how goes it? You're a pretty color, certainly. Why, your liver, man, is upside down. Did you take that medicine? Did he take that medicine, men? Aye, I, sir, he took it, sure enough, returned Morgan, because, you see, since I am mutineer's doctor, or prison doctor as I prefer to call it, says Dr. Livesey in his pleasantest way, I make it a point of honor not to lose a man for King George, God bless him, and the gallows. The rogues looked at each other, but swallowed the home thrust in silence. Dick don't feel well, sir, said one. Don't he? replied the doctor. Well, step up here, Dick, and let me see your tongue. No! I should be surprised if you did. The man's tongue is fit to frighten the French. Another fever. Ah, uh, there, said Morgan, that comed of espialing Bibles. That comes as you call it of being errant asses, retorted the doctor, and not having sense enough to know honest air from poison, and the dry land from a vile, pestiferous slough. I think it most probable, though, of course, it's only an opinion that you'll all have the deuce to pay before you get that malaria out of your systems. Camp in a bog, would you? Silver. I'm surprised at you. You're less of a fool than many. Take you all round. But you don't appear to me to have the rudiments of a notion of the rules of health. Well, he added after he had dosed them round, and they had taken his prescriptions with really laughable humility. More like charity school children than blood guilty mutineers and pirates. Well, that's done for today. And now I should wish to have a talk with that boy, please. And he nodded his head in my direction carelessly. George Mary was at the door, spitting and spluttering over some bad-tasted medicine. But at the first word of the doctor's proposal, he swung round with a deep flush and cried, no, and swore. Silver struck the barrel with his open hand, silence. He roared and looked about him positively like a lion. Doctor, he went on in his usual tones, I was a thinking of that, knowing as how you had a fancy for the boy. We're all humbly grateful for your kindness, and as you see, puts faith in you and takes the drugs down like that much grog. And I take it I've found a way as a suit all. Hawkins, Will you give me your word of honor as a young gentleman for a young gentleman you are, although poor born your word of honor not to slip your cable? I readily gave the pledge required. Then, doctor, said Silver, you just step outside, oh, that stockade, and once you're there I'll bring the boy down on the inside, and I reckon you can yarn through the spars. Good day to you, sir and all our due dies to the squire and Captain Smollett. The explosion of disapproval, which nothing but Silver's black looks had restrained, broke out immediately the doctor had left the house. Silver was roundly accused of playing double of trying to make a separate peace for himself, of sacrificing the interests of his accomplices and victims, and, in one word, of the identical, exact thing that he was doing. It seemed to me so obvious in this case that I could not imagine how he was to turn their anger. But he was twice the man the rest were, and his last night's victory had given him a huge preponderance on their minds. He called them all the fools and dolts you can imagine, said it was necessary I should talk to the doctor, fluttered the chart in their faces, asked them if they could afford to break the treaty the very day they were bound a treasure hunting. No, by thunder, he cried, it's us must break the treaty when the time comes. 
And till then I'll gammon that doctor, if I have to all his boots with brandy. And then he bade them get the fire lit, and stalked out upon his crutch, with his hand on my shoulder, leaving them in a disarray, and silenced by his volubility rather than convinced. Slow, lad, slow, he said. They might round upon us in a twinkle of an eye if we was seen to hurry. Very deliberately, then, did we advance across the sand to where the doctor awaited us on the other side of the stockade. And as soon as we were within easy speaking distance, Silver stopped. You'll make a note of this here also, doctor, says he, and the boy'll tell you how I saved his life. And we're deposed for it too, and you may lay to that. Doctor, when a man steering as near the wind as me playing chuck farthing with the last breath in his body, like you wouldn't think it too much, mayhap, to give him one good word? You'll please bear in mind it's not my life, only now it's that boy's into the bargain, and you'll speak me fair, doctor. And give me a bit, oh, hope to go on, for the sake of mercy. Silver was a changed man once he was out there, and had his back to his friends and the blockhouse. His cheeks seemed to have fallen in. His voice trembled. Never was a soul more dead in earnest. Why, John, you're not afraid? asked Dr. Livesey. Doctor, I'm no coward. No, not I not so much. And he snapped his fingers. If I was, I wouldn't say it. But I'll own up fairly, I've the shakes upon me for the gallows. You're a good man and a true. I never seen a better man. And you'll not forget what I done good. Not any more than you'll forget the bad, I know. And I step aside, see here and leave you and Jim alone. And you'll put that down for me too, for it's a long stretch, is that. So saying... He stepped back a little way, till he was out of earshot, and there sat down upon a tree stump and began to whistle, spinning round now and again upon his seat so as to command a sight, sometimes of me and the doctor, and sometimes of his unruly ruffians, as they went to and fro in the sand between the fire which they were busy rekindling and the house from which they brought forth pork and bread to make the breakfast. So, Jim, said the doctor sadly, here you are. As you have brewed, so shall you drink, my boy. Heaven knows. I cannot find it in my heart to blame you, but this much I will say, be it kind or unkind, when Captain Smollett was well, you dared not have gone off and when he was ill and couldn't help it. By George, it was downright cowardly. I will own that I here began to weep. Doctor, I said, you might spare me. I have blamed myself enough, my life's forfeit anyway, and I should have been dead by now if Silver hadn't stood for me. And doctor, believe this, I can die and I dare say I deserve it, but what I fear is torture. If they come to torture me, Jim. The doctor interrupted, and his voice was quite changed. Jim, I can't have this. Whip over, and we'll run for it. Doctor, said I, I passed my word. I know, I know. He cried, we can't help that, Jim, now. I'll take it on my shoulders, holus bolus, blame and shame. My boy... But stay here, I cannot let you. Jump. One jump and you're out, and we'll run for it like antelopes. No, I replied. You know right well you wouldn't do the thing yourself, neither you nor squire nor captain, and no more will I. Silver trusted me. I passed my word, and back I go. But, doctor, you did not let me finish. If they come to torture me, I might let slip a word of where the ship is, for I got the ship, part by luck and part by risking, and she lies in North Inlet. 
on the southern beach and just below high water. At half tide, she must be high and dry. The ship, exclaimed the doctor. Rapidly, I described to him my adventures, and he heard me out in silence. There is a kind of fate in this, he observed when I had done. Every step, it's you that saves our lives. And do you suppose by any chance that we are going to let you lose yours? That would be a poor return, my boy. You found out the plot. You found Ben Gunn the best deed that ever you did or will do. Though you live to 90. Oh, by Jupiter. And talking of Ben Gunn. Why, this is the mischief in person. Silver, he cried, Silver. I'll give you a piece of advice. He continued as the cook drew near again. Don't you be in any great hurry after that treasure. Why, sir, I do my possible, which that ain't, said Silver. I can only, asking your pardon. Save my life and the boys by seeking for that treasure, and you may lay to that. Well, Silver, replied the doctor, if that is so, I'll go one step further. Look out for squalls when you find it. Sir, said Silver, as between man and man, that's too much and too little. What you're after, why you left the block house, why you given me that their chart, I don't know now, do I? And yet I done your bidding with my eyes shut and never a word of hope. But no, this here's too much. If you won't tell me what you mean plain out, just say so and I'll leave the helm. No, said the doctor musingly, I've no right to say more. It's not my secret, you see, Silver, or I give you my word, I'd tell it you. But I'll go as far with you as I dare go and a step beyond. For I'll have my wig sorted by the captain or I'm mistaken. And first, I'll give you a bit of hope. Silver, if we both get alive out of this wolf trap, I'll do my best to save you, short of perjury. Silver's face was radiant. You couldn't say more, I'm sure, sir. Not if you was my mother, he cried. Well, that's my first concession, added the doctor. My second is a piece of advice. Keep the boy close beside you, and when you need help, halloo. I'm off to seek it for you, and that itself will show you if I speak at random. Goodbye, Jim. And DR. Livesey shook hands with me through the stockade, nodded to Silver, and set off at a brisk pace into the wood. XXXI the treasure hunt flint's pointer, Jim, said Silver when we were alone. If I saved your life, you saved mine, and I'll not forget it. I seen the doctor waving you to run for it with the tail of my eye, I did, and I seen you say no, as plain as hearing. Jim, that's one to you. This is the first glint of hope I had since the attack failed, and I owe it you. And now, Jim, we're to go in for this here treasure hunting, with sealed orders too, and I don't like it. And you and me must stick close, back to back like, and we'll save our necks in spite o oh, fate and fortune. Just then a man hailed us from the fire that breakfast was ready. And we were soon seated here and there about the sand over biscuit and fried junk. They had lit a fire fit to roast an ox. And it was now grown so hot that they could only approach it from the windward. And even there not without precaution. In the same wasteful spirit they had cooked, I suppose three times more than we could eat, and one of them, with an empty laugh, threw what was left into the fire, which blazed and roared again over this unusual fuel. I never in my life saw men so careless of the morrow. Hand to mouth is the only word that can describe their way of doing, and what with wasted food and sleeping sentries. Though they were bold enough for a brush and be done with it, 
I could see their entire unfitness for anything like a prolonged campaign. Even Silver eating away. With Captain Flint upon his shoulder had not a word of blame for their recklessness. And this the more surprised me, for I thought he had never shown himself so cunning as he did then. I, mates, said he, it's lucky you have barbecue to think for you with this here head. I got what I wanted, I did. Sure enough, they have the ship. Where they have it, I don't know yet. But once we hit the treasure, we'll have to jump about and find out. And then, mates, us that has the boats, I reckon, has the upper hand. Thus he kept running on. With his mouth full of the hot bacon, thus he restored their hope and confidence, and, I more than suspect, repaired his own at the same time. As for hostage, he continued, that's his last talk. I guess with them he loves so dear. I've got my peace o news, and thank you to him for that, but it's over and done. I'll take him in a line when we go treasure hunting, for we'll keep him like so much gold in case of accidents, you mark, and in the meantime. Once we got the ship and treasure both and off to sea like jolly companions, why then we'll talk, mister. Hawkins over, we will, and we'll give him his share, to be sure, for all his kindness. It was no wonder the men were in a good humor now. For my part, I was horribly cast down. Should the scheme he had now sketched prove feasible, silver, already doubly a traitor, would not hesitate to adopt it. He had still a foot in either camp, and there was no doubt he would prefer wealth and freedom with the pirates to a bare escape from hanging, which was the best he had to hope on our side. Nay, and even if things so fell out that he was forced to keep his faith with Dr. Livesey, even then what danger lay before us? What a moment that would be when the suspicions of his followers turned to certainty and he and I should have to fight for dear life he a cripple and I a boy against five strong and active seamen. Add to this double apprehension the mystery that still hung over the behavior of my friends, their unexplained desertion of the stockade, their inexplicable session of the chart, or harder still to understand, the doctor's last warning to Silver, look out for squalls when you find it. And you will readily believe how little taste I found in my breakfast and with how uneasy a heart I set forth behind my captors on the quest for treasure. We made a curious figure. Had anyone been there to see us all in soiled sailor clothes and all but me armed to the teeth? Silver had two guns slung about him, one before and one behind besides the great cutlass at his waist and a pistol in each pocket of his square-tailed coat. To complete his strange appearance, Captain Flint sat perched upon his shoulder and gabbling odds and ends of purposeless sea talk. I had a line about my waist and followed obediently after the sea cook, who held the loose end of the rope, now in his free hand now between his powerful teeth, for all the world. I was led like a dancing bear. The other men were variously burthened, some carrying picks and shovels for that had been the very first necessary they brought ashore from the Hispaniola others laden with pork, bread, and brandy for the midday meal. All the stores, I observed, came from our stock, and I could see the truth of Silver's words the night before. Had he not struck a bargain with the doctor, he and his mutineers, deserted by the ship, must have been driven to subsist on clear water and the proceeds of their hunting. Water would have been little to their taste. A sailor is not usually a good shot. And besides all that, when they were so short of eatables, it was not likely they would be very flush of powder. Well, thus equipped, 
We all set out even the fellow with the broken head, who should certainly have kept in shadow and straggled, one after another, to the beach where the two gigs awaited us. Even these bore trace of the drunken folly of the pirates, one in a broken thwart and both in their muddy and unbailed condition. Both were to be carried along with us for the sake of safety, and so, with our numbers divided between them, we set forth upon the bosom of the anchorage. As we pulled over, there was some discussion on the chart. The Red Cross was, of course, far too large to be a guide, and the terms of the note on the back, as you will hear, admitted of some ambiguity. They ran, the reader may remember, thus, tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the end of Enni, Skeleton Island, E.C. and Bayi, 10 feet. A tall tree was thus the principal mark. Now, right before us the anchorage was bounded by a plateau from two to three hundred feet high. Adjoining on the north the sloping southern shoulder of the spyglass and rising again towards the south into the rough, cliffy eminence called the Mizzen Mist Hill. The top of the plateau was dotted thickly with pine trees of varying height. Every here and there, one of a different species rose 40 or 50 feet clear above its neighbors. And which of these was the particular tall tree of Captain Flint could only be decided on the spot and by the readings of the compass. Yet, although that was the case, Every man on board the boats had picked a favorite of his own air. We were halfway over, Long John alone shrugging his shoulders and bidding them wait till they were there. We pulled easily, by Silver's directions, not to weary the hands prematurely, and after quite a long passage, landed at the mouth of the second river that which runs down a woody cleft of the spyglass. Thence, Bending to our left, we began to ascend the slope towards the plateau. At the first outset, heavy, miry ground and a matted, marish vegetation greatly delayed our progress, but by little and little the hill began to steepen and become stony underfoot, and the wood to change its character and to grow in a more open order. It was, indeed, a most pleasant portion of the island that we were now approaching. A heavy scented broom and many flowering shrubs had almost taken the place of grass. Thickets of green nutmeg trees were dotted here and there with the red columns and the broad shadow of the pines, and the first mingled their spice with the aroma of the others. The air, besides, was fresh and stirring and this, under the sheer sunbeams, was a wonderful refreshment to our senses. The party spread itself abroad in a fan shape, shouting and leaping to and fro. About the center, and a good way behind the rest, silver and I followed I tethered by my rope, he plowing with deep pants among the sliding gravel. From time to time, indeed, I had to lend him a hand, or he must have missed his footing and fallen backward down the hill. We had thus proceeded for about half a mile and were approaching the brow of the plateau when the man upon the farthest left began to cry aloud, as if in terror. Shout after shout came from him, and the others began to run in his direction. He can't have found the treasure, said old Morgan, hurrying past us from the right, for that's clean a top. Indeed. As we found when we also reached the spot, it was something very different. At the foot of a pretty big pine and involved in a green creeper, which had even partly lifted some of the smaller bones, a human skeleton lay, with a few shreds of clothing on the ground. I believe a chill struck for a moment to every heart. He was a seaman, said George Mary, who, 
bolder than the rest, had gone up close and was examining the rags of clothing. Leastways, this is good sea cloth. I, I said silver, like enough. You wouldn't look to find a bishop here, I reckon. But what sort of a way is that for bones to lie? Taint in nature, da. Indeed, on a second glance. It seemed impossible to fancy that the body was in a natural position. But for some disarray, the work, perhaps. Of the birds that had fed upon him or of the slow-growing creeper that had gradually enveloped his remains, the man lay perfectly straight, his feet pointing in one direction, his hands, raised above his head like a diver's, pointing directly in the opposite. I've taken a notion into my old numbskull, observed silver. Here's the compass. There's the tip-top P&O skeleton island, sticking out like a tooth. Just take a bearing, will you, along the line of them bones. It was done. The body pointed straight in the direction of the island, and the compass read duly E C and by E. I thought so, cried the cook. This here is a pinter. Right up there is our line for the pole star and the jolly dollars. But, by thunder, if it don't make me cold inside to think of Flint. This is one of his jokes, and no mistake. Him and these six was alone here. He killed, um, every man. And this one he hauled here and laid down by compass. Shiver my timbers. Their long bones and the hair's been yellow. Aye. That would be Allardyce. You mind Allardyce, Tom Morgan? Aye, aye, returned Morgan. I mind him. He owed me money, he did and took my knife ashore with him. Speaking of knives, said another, why don't we find his end lying round? Flint warned the man to pick a seaman's pocket, and the birds, I guess, would leave it be. By the powers, and that's true, cried Silver. There ain't a thing left here, said Mary, still feeling round among the bones, not a copper doit nor a bocce box. It don't look natural to me. No, by gum, it don't, agreed Silver. Not natural. Nor not nice, says you. Great guns. Messmates, but if Flint was living, this would be a hot spot for you and me. Six they were, and six are we, and bones is what they are now. I saw him dead with these here deadlights, said Morgan. Billy took me in. There he laid, with penny pieces on his eyes. Dead I, sure enough he's dead and gone below. Said the fellow with the bandage, but if ever spirit walked, it would be Flint's. Dear heart, but he died bad, did Flint. I, that he did, observed another. Now he raged. And now he hollered for the rum, and now he sang. Fifteen men were his only song, mates, and I tell you true, I never rightly liked to hear it since. It was main hot and the windy was open, and I hear that old song coming out as clear as clear in the death hall on the man already. Come, come, said Silver, stow this talk. He's dead, and he don't walk, that I know, leastways. He won't walk by day, and you may lay to that. Care killed a cat. Fetch a head for the doubloons. We started, certainly, but in spite of the hot sun and the staring daylight, the pirates no longer ran separate and shouting through the wood, but kept side by side and spoke with bated breath. The terror of the dead buccaneer had fallen on their spirits. XXXI the treasure hunt the voice among the trees partly from the damping influence of this alarm, partly to rest silver and the sick folk. The whole party sat down as soon as they had gained the brow of the ascent, the plateau being somewhat tilted towards the west. 
This spot on which we had paused commanded a wide prospect on either hand. Before us, over the treetops, we beheld the cape of the woods fringed with surf behind. We not only looked down upon the anchorage and skeleton island, but saw clear across the spit and the eastern lowlands a great field of open sea upon the east. Sheer above us rose the spyglass, here dotted with single pines, there black with precipices. There was no sound but that of the distant breakers mounting from all round, and the chirp of countless insects in the brush. Not a man, not a sail, upon the sea, the very largeness of the view increased the sense of solitude. Silver, as he sat, took certain bearings with his compass. There are three tall trees, said he, about in the right line from Skeleton Island. Spyglass shoulder, I take it, means that lower peant there. It's child's play to find the stuff now. I've half a mind to dine first. I don't feel sharp, growled Morgan, thinking, oh, Flint, I think it were as done me. Ah, well, my son, you praise your stars he's dead. Said Silver, he were an ugly devil, cried a third pirate with a shudder, that blew in the face too. That was how the rum took him, added Mary, blue. Well, I reckon he was blue. That's a true word. Ever since they had found the skeleton and got upon this train of thought, they had spoken lower and lower, and they had almost got to whispering by now, so that the sound of their talk hardly interrupted the silence of the wood. All of a sudden, out of the middle of the trees in front of us, a thin, high, trembling voice struck up the well-known air and words, fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, -ho, and a bottle of rum. I never have seen men more dreadfully affected than the pirates. The color went from their six faces like enchantment. Some leaped to their feet, some clawed hold of others. Morgan groveled on the ground. It's flint. Bye, cried Mary. The song had stopped as suddenly as it began broken off, you would have said, in the middle of a note, as though someone had laid his hand upon the singer's mouth. Coming through the clear, sunny atmosphere among the green treetops, I thought it had sounded airily and sweetly, and the effect on my companions was the stranger. Come, said Silver. Struggling with his ashen lips to get the word out, this won't do. Stand by to go about. This is a rum start, and I can't name the voice, but it's someone skylarking someone that's flesh and blood. And you may lay to that. His courage had come back as he spoke, and some of the color to his face along with it. Already the others had begun to lend an ear to this encouragement and were coming a little to themselves, when the same voice broke out again not this time singing, but in a faint distant hail that echoed yet fainter among the clefts of the spyglass, Darbim Gra, it wailed for that is the word that best describes the sound, Darbim Gra, Darbim Gra, again and again and again and then rising a little higher, and with an oath that I leave out, fetch aft the rum, Darby. The buccaneers remained rooted to the ground, their eyes starting from their heads. Long after the voice had died away, they still stared in silence, dreadfully, before them. That fixes it, gasped one, let's go. They was his last words, moaned Morgan, his last words above board. Dick had his Bible out and was praying volubly. He had been well brought up, had Dick, before he came to sea and fell among bad companions. Still Silver was unconquered. I could hear his teeth rattle in his head, but he had not yet surrendered. Nobody in this here island ever heard of Darby, he muttered. 
not one but us that's here. And then, making a great effort, shipmates, he cried, I'm here to get that stuff, and I'll not be beat by man or devil. I never was feared of Flint in his life, and by the powers, I'll face him dead. There's 700,000 pound, not a quarter of a mile from here. When did ever a gentleman owe fortune show his stern to that much dollars for a boozy old seaman with a blue mug and him dead too? But there was no sign of reawakening courage in his followers, rather, indeed, of growing terror at the irreverence of his words. Belay there, John, said Mary, don't you cross a spirit and the rest were all too terrified to reply. They would have run away severally had they dared, but fear kept them together and kept them close by John as if his daring helped them. He, on his part, had pretty well fought his weakness down. Spare it? Well, maybe, he said, but there's one thing not clear to me. There was an echo. Now, no man ever seen a spirit with a shadow. Well then, what's he doing with an echo to him, I should like to know? That ain't a nature, surely. This argument seemed weak enough to me. But you can never tell what will affect the superstitious, and to my wonder, George Mary was greatly relieved. Well, that's so, he said. You've a head upon your shoulders, John, and no mistake. About ship, mates. This here crew is on a wrong tack, I do believe. And come to think on it, it was like Flint's voice, I grant you, but not just so clear away like it, after all. It was like her somebody else's voice now, it was like her. By the powers, Ben Gunn roared silver. I, and so it were, cried Morgan, springing on his knees. Ben Gunn it were. It don't make much odds, do it. Now, ask Dick. Ben Gunn's not here in the body any more in Flint. But the older hands greeted this remark with scorn. Why, nobody minds Ben Gunn, cried Mary. Dead or alive, nobody minds him. It was extraordinary how their spirits had returned and how the natural color had revived in their faces. Soon they were chatting together with intervals of listening. And not long after, hearing no further sound, they shouldered the tools and set forth again. Mary walking first with Silver's compass to keep them on the right line with Skeleton Island. He had said the truth Dead or alive, nobody minded Ben Gunn. Dick alone still held his Bible and looked around him as he went with fearful glances, but he found no sympathy and Silver even joked him on his precautions. I told you, said he, I told you you had espialed your Bible. If it ain't no good to swear by, what do you suppose a spirit would give for it? Not that, and he snapped his big fingers, halting a moment on his crutch. But Dick was not to be comforted, indeed. It was soon plain to me that the lad was falling sick, hastened by heat, exhaustion, and the shock of his alarm, the fever, predicted by Dr. Livesey, was evidently growing swiftly higher. It was fine open walking here, upon the summit, our way lay a little downhill, for, as I have said, the plateau tilted towards the west. The pines, great and small, grew wide apart. And even between the clumps of nutmeg and azalea, wide open spaces baked in the hot sunshine, striking, as we did, pretty near northwest across the island, we drew on the one hand ever nearer under the shoulders of the spyglass and on the other, looked ever wider over that western bay where I had once tossed and trembled in the coracle. The first of the tall trees was reached, and by the bearings proved the wrong one. 
so with the second. The third rose nearly 200 feet into the air above a clump of underwood a giant of a vegetable with a red column as big as a cottage and a wide shadow around in which a company could have maneuvered. It was conspicuous far to see both on the east and west and might have been entered as a sailing mark upon the chart. But it was not its size that now impressed my companions. It was the knowledge that 700,000 pounds in gold lay somewhere buried below its spreading shadow. The thought of the money, as they drew nearer, swallowed up their previous terrors. Their eyes burned in their heads. Their feet grew speedier and lighter. Their whole soul was bound up in that fortune, that whole lifetime of extravagance and pleasure that lay waiting there for each of them. Silver hobbled, grunting on his crutch. His nostrils stood out and quivered. He cursed like a madman when the flies settled on his hot and shiny countenance. He plucked furiously at the line that held me to him and from time to time turned his eyes upon me with a deadly look. Certainly, he took no pains to hide his thoughts. And certainly, I read them like print. In the immediate nearness of the gold, all else had been forgotten. His promise and the doctor's warning were both things of the past. And I could not doubt that he hoped to seize upon the treasure, find and board the Hispaniola under cover of night, cut every honest throat about that island, and sail away as he had at first intended, laden with crimes and riches. Shaken as I was with these alarms, it was hard for me to keep up with the rapid pace of the treasure hunters. Now and again I stumbled, and it was then that Silver plucked so roughly at the rope and launched at me his murderous glances. Dick, who had dropped behind us and now brought up the rear, was babbling to himself both prayers and curses as his fever kept rising. This also added to my wretchedness and to crown all, I was haunted by the thought of the tragedy that had once been acted on that plateau when that ungodly buccaneer with the blue face he who died at Savannah. Singing and shouting for drink had there, with his own hand, cut down his six accomplices. This grove that was now so peaceful must then have rung with cries, I thought. And even with the thought I could believe I heard it ringing still. We were now at the margin of the thicket, huzzah, mates, all together, shouted Mary, and the foremost broke into a run. And suddenly, not ten yards further, we beheld them stop. A low cry arose. Silver doubled his pace, digging away with the foot of his crutch like one possessed. And next moment he and I had come also to a dead halt. Before us was a great excavation, not very recent, for the sides had fallen in and grass had sprouted on the bottom. In this were the shaft of a pick broken in two and the boards of several packing cases strewn around. On one of these boards I saw, branded with a hot iron, the name Walrus the name of Flint's ship. All was clear to probation. The cash had been found and rifled. The 700,000 pounds were gone. 33 the fall of a chieftain there never was such an overturn in this world. Each of these six men was as though he had been struck. But with silver the blow passed almost instantly. Every thought of his soul had been set full stretch, like a racer on that money. Well, he was brought up in a single second, dead, and he kept his head, found his temper, and changed his plan before the others had had time to realize the disappointment. Jim, he whispered, take that and stand by for trouble. And he passed me a double-barreled pistol. At the same time, he began quietly moving northward, and in a few steps had put the hollow between us two and the other five. 
Then he looked at me and nodded as much as to say, Here's a narrow corner as, indeed, I thought it was. His looks were not quite friendly, and I was so revolted at these constant changes that I could not forbear whispering. So you've changed sides again. There was no time left for him to answer in. The buccaneers, with oaths and cries, began to leap, one after another, into the pit and to dig with their fingers. Throwing the boards aside as they did so, Morgan found a piece of gold. He held it up with a perfect spout of oaths. It was a two-guinea piece, and it went from hand to hand among them for a quarter of a minute. Two guineas, roared Mary, shaking it at silver. That's your 700,000 pounds, is it? You're the man for bargains, ain't you? You're him that never bungled nothing, you wooden-headed lover. Dig away, boys, said Silver with the coolest insolence. You'll find some pig nuts, and I shouldn't wonder. Pig nuts, repeated Mary, in a scream. Mates, do you hear that? I tell you now, that man there knew it all along. Look in the face of him, and you'll see it wrote there. Ah, uh, Mary, remarked Silver, standing for captain again. You're a pushing lad, to be sure but this time everyone was entirely in Mary's favor. They began to scramble out of the excavation, darting furious glances behind them. One thing I observed, which looked well for us, they all got out upon the opposite side from Silver. Well, there we stood, two on one side, five on the other, the pit between us, and nobody screwed up high enough to offer the first blow. Silver never moved. He watched them. Very upright on his crutch and looked as cool as ever I saw him. He was brave and no mistake. At last Mary seemed to think a speech might help matters. Mates, says he. There's two of them alone there. One's the old cripple that brought us all here and blundered us down to this. The other's that cub that I mean to have the heart of. Now, mates, he was raising his arm and his voice and plainly meant to lead a charge. But just then crack, 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 three musket shots flashed out of the thicket. Mary tumbled head foremost into the excavation. The man with the bandage spun round like a teetotum and fell all his length upon his side, where he lay dead, but still twitching and the other three turned and ran for it with all their might. Before you could wink, Long John had fired two barrels of a pistol into the struggling Mary. And as the man rolled up his eyes at him in the last agony, George, said he, I reckon I settled you. At the same moment, the doctor, Gray, and Ben Gunn joined us with smoking muskets, from among the nutmeg trees, forward, cried the doctor, double quick, my lads, we must head em off the boats. And we set off at a great pace, sometimes plunging through the bushes to the chest. I tell you, but Silver was anxious to keep up with us. The work that man went through, leaping on his crutch till the muscles of his chest were fit to burst, was work no sound man ever equaled, and so thinks the doctor. As it was, he was already thirty yards behind us and on the verge of strangling when we reached the brow of the slope. Doctor. He hailed, see there. No hurry. Sure enough, there was no hurry. In a more open part of the plateau, we could see the three survivors still running in the same direction as they had started right for Mizzen Mist Hill. We were already between them and the boats, and so we four sat down to breathe, while Long John, mopping his face, came slowly up with us. Thank ye kindly, doctor. Says he, you came in in about the nick, I guess, for me and Hawkins. And so it's you, Ben Gunn, he added, 
Well, you're a nice one, to be sure. I'm Ben Gunn, I am, replied the maroon. Wriggling like an eel in his embarrassment, and he added, after a long pause, how do, Mr. Silver? Pretty well, I thank you, says you. Ben, Ben, murmured Silver, to think as you've done me. The doctor sent back Gray for one of the pickaxes deserted, in their flight, by the mutineers, and then as we proceeded leisurely downhill to where the boats were lying, related in a few words what had taken place. It was a story that profoundly interested Silver, and Ben Gunn, the half-idiot maroon, was the hero from beginning to end. Ben, in his long, lonely wanderings about the island, had found the skeleton it was he that had rifled it. He had found the treasure. He had dug it up. It was the haft of his pickaxe that lay broken in the excavation. He had carried it on his back in many weary journeys. From the foot of the tall pine to a cave, he had on the two-pointed hill at the northeast angle of the island. And there it had lain stored in safety since two months before the arrival of the Hispaniola. When the doctor had wormed this secret from him on the afternoon of the attack, and when next morning he saw the anchorage deserted, he had gone to Silver, given him the chart, which was now useless given him the stores. For Ben Gunn's cave was well supplied with goats, meat salted by himself given anything and everything to get a chance of moving in safety from the stockade to the two-pointed hill, there to be clear of malaria and keep a guard upon the money. As for you, Jim, he said, it went against my heart, but I did what I thought best for those who had stood by their duty. And if you are not one of these, whose fault was it? That morning, finding that I was to be involved in the horrid disappointment he had prepared for the mutineers, he had run all the way to the cave, and leaving the squire to guard the captain, had taken Gray and the maroon and started, making the diagonal across the island to be at hand beside the pine. Soon, however, he saw that our party had the start of him, and Ben Gunn, being fleet of foot, had been dispatched in front to do his best alone. Then it had occurred to him to work upon the superstitions of his former shipmates, and he was so far successful that Gray and the doctor had come up and were already ambushed before the arrival of the treasure hunters, Oth said Silver. It were fortunate for me that I had Hawkins here. You would have let old John be cut to bits and never given it a thought, doctor. Not a thought, replied Dr. Livesey cheerily. And by this time we had reached the gigs. The doctor, with the pickaxe, demolished one of them, and then we all got aboard the other and set out to go round by sea for North Inlet. This was a run of eight or nine miles. Silver, though he was almost killed already with fatigue, was set to an oar, like the rest of us, and we were soon skimming swiftly over a smooth sea. Soon we passed out of the straits and doubled the southeast corner of the island, round which, four days ago, we had towed the Hispaniola. As we passed the two-pointed hill, we could see the black mouth of Ben Gunn's cave and a figure standing by it, leaning on a musket. It was the squire, and we waved a handkerchief and gave him three cheers, in which the voice of Silver joined as heartily as any. Three miles farther, just inside the mouth of North Inlet, what should we meet but the Hispaniola, cruising by herself? The last flood had lifted her, and had there been much wind or a strong tide current, as in the southern anchorage, we should never have found her more, or found her stranded beyond help. As it was, 
There was little amiss beyond the wreck of the mainsail. Another anchor was got ready and dropped in a fathom and a half of water. We all pulled round again to Rum Cove, the nearest point for Ben Gunn's treasure house, and then Gray, single-handed, returned with the gig to the Hispaniola, where he was to pass the night on guard. A gentle slope ran up from the beach to the entrance of the cave. At the top, the squire met us. To me he was cordial and kind, saying nothing of my escapade either in the way of blame or praise. At Silver's polite salute he somewhat flushed. John Silver, he said, you're a prodigious villain and impostor a monstrous impostor, sir. I am told I am not to prosecute you. Well, then, I will not. But the dead men, sir, hang about your neck like millstones. Thank you kindly, sir, replied Long John, again saluting. I dare you to thank me, cried the squire. It is a gross dereliction of my duty. Stand back. And thereupon we all entered the cave. It was a large, airy place, with a little spring and a pool of clear water overhung with ferns. The floor was sand. Before a big fire lay Captain Smollett, and in a far corner, only duskily flickered over by the blaze. I beheld great heaps of coin and quadrilaterals built of bars of gold. That was Flint's treasure that we had come so far to seek and that had cost already the lives of seventeen men from the Hispaniola. How many it had cost in the amassing! What blood and sorrow! What good ships scuttled on the deep! What brave men walking the plank blindfold! What shot of cannon! What shame and lies and cruelty! Perhaps no man alive could tell. Yet there were still three upon that island silver, and old Morgan, and Ben Gunn who had each taken his share in these crimes. As each had hoped in vain to share in the reward. Come in, Jim, said the captain. You're a good boy in your line, Jim, but I don't think you and me'll go to sea again. You're too much of the born favorite for me. Is that you, John Silver? What brings you here, man? Come back to my duty, sir, returned Silver. Ah, said the captain, and that was all he said. What a supper I had of it that night, with all my friends around me, and what a meal it was, with Ben Gunn's salted goat and some delicacies and a bottle of old wine from the Hispaniola. Never, I am sure, were people gayer or happier. And there was Silver, sitting back almost out of the firelight, but eating heartily, prompt to spring forward when anything was wanted, even joining quietly in our laughter the same bland, polite, obsequious seamen of the voyage out. XXXIV and last the next morning we fell early to work. For the transportation of this great mass of gold near a mile by land to the beach, and thence three miles by boat to the Hispaniola, was a considerable task for so small a number of workmen. The three fellows still abroad upon the island did not greatly trouble us. A single sentry on the shoulder of the hill was sufficient to ensure us against any sudden onslaught, and we thought, besides, they had had more than enough of fighting. Therefore the work was pushed on briskly. Gray and Ben Gunn came and went with the boat, while the rest during their absences piled treasure on the beach. Two of the bars, slung in a rope's end, made a good load for a grown man one that he was glad to walk slowly with. For my part, as I was not much use at carrying, I was kept busy all day in the cave packing the minted money into bread bags. It was a strange collection, like Billy Bones's hoard for the diversity of coinage. But so much larger and so much more varied that I think I never had more pleasure than in sorting them. 
English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, George, and Louise's. Doubloons and double guineas and moidors and sequins, the pictures of all the kings of Europe for the last hundred years. Strange oriental pieces stamped with what looked like wisps of string or bits of spider's web, round pieces and square pieces and pieces bored through the middle. As if to wear them round your neck nearly every variety of money in the world must, I think, have found a place in that collection, and for number, I am sure they were like autumn leaves. So that my back ached with stooping and my fingers with sorting them out. Day after day this work went on. By every evening a fortune had been stowed aboard. But there was another fortune waiting for the morrow, and all this time we heard nothing of the three surviving mutineers. At last I think it was on the third night the doctor and I were strolling on the shoulder of the hill where it overlooks the lowlands of the isle, when, from out the thick darkness below, 